Yes. Valerie, all set. We're going to call the meeting to order here at 731. I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out tonight. Uh, Just uh, currently uh, from the board, we have uh, Janet, Alan, Chow, Ginny, Sherry, Nancy, Dick, Milton, Andy. Um, and we do expect um, Lynn and Greg to show up later. We haven't received any word that they're not. All right. For senior staff, we have Susan, and I see Sherry has her, her things there. Um, <clears throat> this is our board meeting, uh, so it is being recorded, and it also is being streamed uh, on the Internet. Um, so just to let everyone know. Our civility principles, uh, just remind everyone, uh, speak kindly, don't speak ill, accept and give constructive criticism, apologize earnestly, respect others' opinions, respect other people's times. Announcement of closed meetings. There was a closed meeting of the Risk Management Committee on March 22nd, 2018. <clears throat> Committee members um, Milton, Susan, and Lynn, the vote to close was unanimous. <clears throat> the meeting was closed at 7.07 p.m. and uh, ended at 7.23 p.m. Uh, it was closed under Section 4, consultation with staff personnel, consultants, attorneys, board members, or other persons in connection with pending or potential litigation or other legal matters. And the purpose was to discuss uh, general liability claims and the general liability self-insurance program. <clears throat> Welcome, Greg. Hi. Uh, there was a closed meeting of the Board of Directors on March 22nd, 2018. Um, see. Dick, Lynn, Janet, Allen, uh, Milton, Nancy, Greg, Andy, Ginny, and Chow were in attendance. The vote to close was uh, 9 0 0. Uh, the meeting was closed at 10 37 and opened at 11 20. Uh, it was uh, closed under Section 4, consultation with staff, personnel, consultants, attorneys, board members, or other persons in <clears throat> connection with pending or potential litigation, other legal matters. The purpose of the meeting was an update on several legal matters. Uh, welcome, Lynn. Okay. So, yeah. Approval of the agenda. Okay. Um, under consent agenda, um, I'd like to postpone uh, item number two until the closed meeting because there was an objection and consent means everybody agrees. So we'll do that at the closed meeting. So outside of that, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Nancy moved and Chow seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, no disclosure of conflicts of interest were given to me. So move right into resident speak out. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. So I have the first sheet, and here comes the second. Thank you, Val. Um, first up, and, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, because sometimes I have difficulties. Uh, first up is Ingrid Pine. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you. Okay, got to give it back. Give it back fast. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you. Um, my name is Ingrid Pine. I've been living in Columbia. It says here for nine years, but I just realized that it's 2018, and that means it's ten. <laughs> <laughs> I am a proud member of the Oakland Mills community, and in full disclosure, I am a former employee at the Still Point Spa at Haven on the Lake. First, I would like to say that my time at the Still Point was a joy. I was one of the first employees to be hired for the spa, and I remember setting up the space when it was still in the final stages of construction. Uh, Tori Katie and Marla Peoples were transparent, open, and thoughtful in their dealings with the staff of the spa and CA at large. It has come to my attention and the attention of many people in uh, the Columbia community that there is ongoing legal action between the Still Point Spa and Columbia Association. Uh, the Still Point had been very profitable uh, within their first year, far more profitable than was projected. And they had been paying CA regularly until 
within two years, CA tried to renege on the agreed partnership that was in place. It concerns me on many levels, but I'd like to outline a few. CA is targeting a small women-owned business that has been a draw to Haven on the Lake, and by doing so has set a precedent wherein they are willing to trample active, caring business owners within the city. I have seen the board notes from the initial meeting where the partnership was discussed, and it is clear that going into the third year of operations, CA abruptly tried to walk back on the outlined agreement. In the initial stages of the impending lawsuit and in an effort to bring about an amicable resolution to its dispute with CA, the still point attempted to find, uh, find an alternative location in downtown Columbia out of which to operate a spa and had gotten as far as a letter of intent with a prospective landlord. Shortly after, the prospective landlord came to the still point and informed them that due to its relationship <coughs> with CA, the still point could not rent any of their downtown retail spaces. In a time where CA is actively considering closing some of our community centers, one of which is mine, it seems strange to me that there's money for this ongoing legal action, but not to serve the purpose of what CA was intended for or what your website actually states or what's on that board right there, working every day in hundreds of ways to make Columbia an even better place to live, work, and play. These community centers house low-cost daycares, preschools, even services for retired individuals, summer camps. Um, and there are all valuable resources in a community that was intended to serve all people. These matters are extremely serious, and while I can recognize that things often spin out of control and go a place where no one initially intended, <coughs> please restore our faith in Columbia Association's leadership and resolve this matter quickly and return your your attention to your intended purpose, which is to help support and nurture our community. Thanks, Ingrid. Yeah. Questions? Thank you. Well, I, I do oh, have one question. Go. I'm just confused. You you talked about notes from a, a meeting. Yes, there were was notes. Was that a meeting I, of CA or was yes, that a meeting was a between CA? CA's? And the, um, <laughs> a and CA board meeting or a meeting? CA board meeting, and I believe uh, it was discussed by Rob Goldman, the initial partnership setup. Um, I, do you have a copy of them at home, which I can email to the board if That'd necessary? Do you remember the date? Uh, it was, mm, G, I think it was a June meeting from at least four years ago, three years ago, four years ago, somewhere in that range. Yes. So I received some anonymous like paper, legal document from somebody delivered to my door. So is that from you or somebody? No, else? Okay. no, no. I was only very recently made aware of it. And I wanted to disclose my relationship with them as a former employee because I think that that's mm -hmm. how you do things above board. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Jeff uh, Domber. Welcome, Jeff. Consider the uh, the miles and miles of trails that uh, connect north and south, um, Owen Brown to Huntington, down to Savage Park, and so forth. Um, this uh, this stretch of road um, has become uh, kind of a critical link um, in terms of uh, families being able to use this area. <coughs>
training wheels and a little child um, on, the, on the bike uh, doesn't listen to mommy and darts out uh, into the area where the trucks and other vehicles may, may go. Um, and uh, we have, we have a, a ter terrible problem with that. Um, I just uh, wanted to draw your attention to um, this issue and, and simply hope that um, something can be um, resolved where the vehicle Thanks, Jeff. Any questions, Craig? Yeah. Do you live in that immediate area of yes, the? Yes, I do. Yeah, I go down there quite a bit, even though I'm from Hickory Ridge. Um, I don't know. It seems like a lot of us were caught off guard. Mm -hmm. Although I saw that stone house being demolished, I saw it once it had been knocked down. I guess my radar should have gone off at that point. Why they tear that that down? I mean, had you not seen like I mean, for the folks who live in the area, had anyone seen a plan for that site? <laughs> Um, that, you know, put that entrance on Old Guilford Road, a road that you, I, and most of us thought was a trail. Right. You know, had anyone seen a, a plan for that um, in, the, in the past? No, I heard nothing. As a matter of fact, I, um, I probably biked and jumped past <laughs> that um, rather tattered property, you know, thousands of times. And I always wondered, you know, I wonder what's going to happen with that. In the back of my mind, I guess I was always thinking, it was some sort of imminent domain, and you know everything will be all right eventually. Um, and to be honest, I didn't—I wasn't too alarmed when I saw the um, the property <laughs> being used. I thought, you know, perhaps the county had a um, an idea of, of how that area might be used. I honestly didn't think it was prior property. I just had always pictured in my mind that somehow the county had taken that over. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Nancy? Were there signs or anything indicating that there were proposed plans going to the county about these changes in that space? Uh, I didn't. If there were, I didn't see any. Um, I was completely caught off guard. I just saw there was a house one day and none the next. <coughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alan? From your point of view, or if you know, besides our bully pulpit and our relationship with the county, is there anything that we could do to slow this down, put a roadblock in it, or, or are there decisions that you're aware of that we have to make that would either move this forward or what was that? Um, you know, that's not terribly clear to me, but I know that there's um, you know alternate entrances that have been proposed, um, but that I think is on county property. Um, there is. Uh, in the image that I uploaded for you all to look at, I believe that um, if you have that in front of you, it's there's kind of a little red striped driveway that I um, kind of got out my color pencils with. And, um, I believe that crisscrosses a, a CA owned um, property. So if we were to go with your suggestion, we would have to affirmatively agree to that. Is that Co correct? Yes. I mean that would be a concession. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, as I see it, the uh, the best result would be for the road to remain vehicle free. I would be give, I'd be willing to give up a lot of concessions, you know, for that. Um, I certainly don't think um, you know maybe magenta bricks, uh, you know, for the builder would be uh, acceptable. But um, there's a lot of things that I would, as a resident, um, would be willing to, um, you know, let go of uh, if I knew that um, their part of the concession was no trucks on the road and the, and the trail remains pretty much as it's presently used. Thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, next up we have um, Richard uh, Briggs. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. So um, I'm Richard Briggs. I've lived in this area since 2007. And um, I'm just going to follow on briefly to what Jeff said. Um, we greatly appreciate the trail. We've used it time and time again since we've been in this area. We think it's very special. Um, to me, I just want to say that once you have that rail bridge that has been restored, um, to me it's very awkward to say this is trail and going to Elkhorn is trail, but then this little stretch of road technically is a county road. Therefore, we can have an entrance there and use that entrance as we see fit. 
Um, a lot of us, and I'm sure a lot of people know, uh, know about this, had a meeting at Hammond High School about a month ago where we learned a lot more about the project. And I think we learned at that time that CA and the county had been, had been working with the developer trying to get concessions. Um, and I think as far as I know, as I understand, both bodies have circled back to that developer following the meeting at Hammond High School. And I think concessions have been offered. Um, what I am seeing is a resonant aesthetics of the project aside. It was a beautiful home. I remember an older man living there. I hadn't seen anybody very often on the property for eight or nine years. Um, aesthetics of the project aside, I, th I think, are, are questionable. Um, what I'm seeing is a lot of people, A, the community was not involved in this at all. And I think there are real questions about legislation that needs to be enacted so that these projects include the community and give the county and CA more say-so in the earlier stages of the, product, uh, the projects. Um, but what I'm seeing, and the developer may not here, be here to defend himself, but all of the businesses along Guilford Road have entrances from Guilford Road. All of them have fire hydrants. I passed there last night, and they all have fire hydrants. I don't know anything about runoff. I can't speak to that. Um, some other people here may. But what I'm seeing is the developer is very kindly saying, thank you so much for your suggestions, and then not budging. And I really think the answer here is to find some sort of middle ground so that, again, the stretch of road can remain traffic-free and the developer can have their, their storage units. And I really love Jeff's suggestions of the side entrance. I think it would be a little bit of a quick turn and turn again to go into the property. But to me, it's just common sense. And I hope we can make some progress on that. Joe? And then Greg? So when I look at the map, it's very natural if they can just extend that a little bit, just use the Guilford Road, right? And uh, what's the reason they want to like, move back to the trail, along the trail? They've listed um, six or seven reasons. One of the main ones are um, they need some sort of natural runoff. And uh, some of the people here might be able to speak more um, knowledgeably about that. That's one of their main objections. Um, they have cited traffic concerns for turning from Guilford Road, which again, I'm glad they're taking that into consideration. I just feel it's overstated. Again, all the businesses along there have turns um, from Guilford Road. Looks to me like they could share the driveway with the building next door, but I'm, I'm sure that's not done, but um, that would seem to be a natural solution. Um, they have cited that there is a fire hydrant where they might have a turn, I believe. Again, all the properties have fire hydrants every 200 yards, something like that. I was just down there last night, and they're all living quite amicably with fire hydrants there. So again, I, without being unfair to the developer, they have a huge investment in this project, but um, I just don't think they understand the community's resistance, and I think a lot of their objections are overstated. That, that's my opinion. Greg? How long have you been? How long, how long have, you, have you lived in that area? 11 years. When's the last time the county had a street sign up that said Old Guilford Road to alert people to the fact that this was something other than a trail? Do you know that? I don't. I can tell you that I went to the trouble of raking up that circle area um, that I guess demarcates the end of Old Guilford Road because there was so much debris built up along there and I like things clean and I don't know, it just seemed like a thing to do, and I moved the TV away that had been sitting there for a month. Mm -hmm. So to me, it, when you say it's a county road, I... I don't say it's a county road. By def <laughs> right, when one says it's a, yeah, when one says it's a county road, it's not a usable county road. Somebody else pointed out at our meeting that it's not snow plowed or right. anything like that. So it's just, it's technically apparently a county road, or so we've been told. Dick? Uh, I was just there today, and I did see a street sign, but it looked like a new one, um, looked quite new, in fact. Um, I uh, was, as I, as I mentioned, I was there. I noticed that they've kind of fenced off part of the road. Is, is, do you know anything about that? Yes, I think that's to demarcate the walking path that we were supposed to use so that their vehicles can come and go as they, as they need to and um, not – 
spill over and hit pedestrians or cyclists. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's there are plans to make a widen the trail to the left to accommodate pedestrians and cyclists. I think a lot of us, us feel that that's not ideal, mm -hmm. um, but that's what's going on. I was just yeah. curious if, as far if as I know, bollards would. You know, in, in lieu of nothing else happening, if, if putting bollards in between the trail and the road, you know, like those big poles that go in the ground that block off the trail part and the street part, would that improve the state? I'm not familiar with this area, so I apologize for that. But, um, you know, so if they are widening that trail, if they mm -hmm. put in, you know, the, the big columns in the ground that prevent any vehicles from going past that, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there could be the risk of a child riding through, but mm -hmm. would that sort of, um, would, would that potentially I, I, you I, at all? <laughs> I would think it might. Mm -hmm. um, again, what's going, if you go down there now, you're seeing that four-fifths of the road has been cut off for use for vehicles. Mm -hmm. So they're pushing the pedestrians and cyclists to the side. Bollards might more clearly demarcate that. Um, again, you're, you're talking about a trail that has been used by, and not to be uncompromising about it. No, I'm just. I, I, I'm I just, know. Yeah, I, I'm trying no, to I, picture where I, the bollards totally are. No, I know. I'm trying to figure. <laughs> trying to picture. Yeah. Here. There are bollards there that block vehicles from going further once you get to that mm -hmm. circle. So I mean, I suppose that would help, but then you're getting sort of a jerry-built yeah. solution. But yeah, Sherry. Yeah, um, just an answer to that. It, the, the first attempt was having um, volumes, you know, sort of on it. And that did absolutely nothing, actually. When I was down there, I actually saw things tilted. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very tight, narrow road. It's the old, old 32. And actually, part of it has been um, cut off, and, and it's gated. And, and it's, the, the, the county had pulled up the asphalt. Mm -hmm. So that is not a usable road. That's certainly a visual signal to everyone that it's not a usable road. There's no entrance from there. And then as you go down this about 100, and 100 yards maybe, mm -hmm. um, there, there's just a sort of like a little turnaround. And it doesn't go any further. So it doesn't go this way. It doesn't go that way. It's just the trailhead. And in fact, in front of the, uh, it, what it says is Parks and Rec says Patuxent Branch, Trail. Right. That's that's trailhead. That's what it says. So I was going to ask you whether you not only had ever seen any, um, you know, snow plowing, but in the time that you've been there, and I know that you're almost there daily. Yes. Um, have you ever seen any garbage trucks or any any other kind of? The thing? only thing I can recall are um, vehicles involved with either cleaning up the path, the uh -huh. trail, or we had a sewage project for about 18 to 24 long months, yeah. <laughs> circa 2009-10. Right. So I have seen the occasional work vehicle mm -hmm. but then down they left there. And they yes. Left. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Um, Thanks, Richard. Sure. Next, we have Harry Dunbar. Harry, I guess. Nice shirt. <laughs> Welcome, Harry. Welcome, Harry. Thank you very much. I'm Harry Dunbar. I moved to Oakland Mills, 1973. I served on the uh, Oakland Mills Village Board as well as the uh, council rep for Oakland Mills uh, when Jim Rouse was still running things in, in Howard County, or I should say in Columbia. Uh, I'm here uh, this evening to ask you to keep the neighborhood centered, to not sell the, the neighborhood center. I can't believe that uh, that's even being considered. Even back in Rouse's uh, era, during his time, uh, the neighborhood centers were not known for their profitability. Uh, they were always they, uh, required funding from, from, from other sources with NCA. Uh, my children uh, attended a Montessori school in Talbot Springs. Uh, there was a Montessori school there for a number of years. It went on to from Montessori school to Oakland Mills High School, and from there they went on to 
uh, one of America's finest colleges in Massachusetts. Uh, my son has a, uh, one graduate degree. He only has one where, where his sister has two. Uh, we now have grandchildren, and I would like for them to uh, be able to, uh, uh, if, if, if my son sees fit, uh, to be able to use the small businesses that, that are found in, uh, in the neighborhood centers uh, here in Columbia. Uh, in addition, the Locust Park Center, the one that was, I saw a picture of in the newspaper, uh, uh, is a place where the Columbia Democratic Club has for over 30 years have, ha have meetings there. There's also a small business there, a daycare center. So if you, you close these businesses, you're putting uh, uh, workers, people that have jobs, that are dependent upon these daycare centers uh, uh, for their children's uh, uh, well-being and safety, uh, uh, you're putting those people out of business. And I, I, I just wanted to, I'm concerned about that because I think I saw the number of eight. You want to close eight centers, and you just can't do that. Uh, if I'm elected Howard County Executive, I will work with this body. My administration will work with this body to assist you in any way that we possibly can to see that the, uh, the Rouse vision, the Rouse spirit remains in Columbia. There appears to be now forces that are only chasing the dollar. All they want to do is how they can make the next dollar. They're not concerned about the community needs. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you if anybody had made you aware of where we are in this situation, that, that a rec simply a recommendation has been made by staff and decisions are way down the road and uh, only going to happen after we involve the community. No, I'm, I was not aware of that. I just saw the, the uh, one uh, uh, article and I freaked out. <laughs> Understand, understandably. <laughs> understandably. Yeah. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Keith uh, Heivel. Welcome, Keith. Uh, my name again is Keith Heivel, head of the chair of the Golf and Green Committee, and I want to thank the committee for. Uh, consideration for Fairway Hills to be allowed to have uh, alcohol or beer on the golf cart. Uh, I want to emphasize again that the Golf and Green Committee definitely supports that initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Keith. Uh, next up, we have Ken Walsh. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. I've lived here, uh, I guess, since 1971. Been playing golf uh, since 1986 at uh, Hobbits and then later Fairway Hills for uh, oh, probably a couple times each year. And um, while I rarely ever have a beer on a golf course when I can, I decided to come here tonight because I'm sort of ticked off <laughs> that one set of golfers would be treated entirely different than another set of golfers. And I've read the concerns that were raised by residents in the past. And I thought to myself, you know, in this day of uh, cell phones and rangers on the golf course and their really uncanny ability to diffuse situations, they are just uh, really neat when we have slow golfers or, um, you know, golfers just not moving along to come along and work with them and, you know, we don't have quarrels, but we deal with situations. And in that era, I really feel that the golfers should all be treated alike. And if there are problems, we should come together as a community and deal with them. So if those resonant concerns, which I've never seen, but when and if they ever occur, we order as golfers and residents, get on our phone, call the clubhouse, get the ranger out there, and in minutes, resolve and diffuse that situation. So I come tonight to ask you to treat us all alike. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Any questions? Alan, have you gotten any good? <laughs> Excuse me? Have you gotten any good at the golf? I mean, no, I actually, I don't even have a handicap. I just go out because I like to hang out outside, and I don't have my kids to take in the woods and go hiking. So I play golf, and typically I have a cup of coffee or a beer when I get in. 
Uh, I, I, the beer doesn't <laughs> usually help. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, we have uh, Chris Oliva. Welcome, Chris. Hi. Good evening, Chris Aliba. Um, I live in Hickory Ridge. Uh, I think all of you know me. I'm going to depart from my prepared remarks just slightly here. The um, self-storage in uh, um, King's Contrivance is Exhibit A on why the NT zone protects people on uses. Oh. That land is zoned M1. And what that means is that they can come in to DPZ and apply to put any use that's listed on the M1, okay? DPZ has to allow it. There's no public notification requirement required. That's why the guy didn't see notification. Hmm. Now, <laughs> in the NT zone, it was in fact designed to give greater control. The problem is that the county is treating the NT zone like it's M1 or B1 or whatever it is. And that was not the intent. In my remarks, on the second page, I start with the syllogism. And it says here, state law requires all zoning regulation amendments to be done by a legislative body. FDPs are a zoning regulation as stipulated in section 125 of the Howard County Zoning Regulations. So it follows that only the county council can change land use on a recorded final development plan. And uh, I cited the various code sections. I'm not going to um, take my time or your time up there. You can see them uh, for yourself. Um, in addition to that, I want to speak about the covenants. Attached with your attachment here are the relevant pages from the Hillcroft Executive Park, which is where we are right now, uh, the Guilford Industrial Park, which is on Snowden River Parkway, and the Oakland Ridge Industrial Park. Now, I want to call your attention to the Hillcroft. They're the same one on page two of that, section 10.03, failure to enforce. What it says there very plainly is that HRD, CA, any owner in the park have the right to enforce the covenant. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you should, if somebody comes to you, a commercial property owner, and says, hey, we'd like you to enforce the covenants, you can say, hey, we're not really situated to do that. But here, look, 10.03, you're allowed to do it. And owners are empowered to do it. And uh, so um, the main message of my uh, um, um, presentation tonight is all the tools are in place already. We, we don't really need to do anything. <laughs> and uh, the, the way that the NT zone works, after a building is built, it's essentially etched in stone. You can go back to the county council and amend it, but you're not allowed to go change it, and that's what, how it was designed. And I met with a lawyer, a land use lawyer in Carroll County a couple of weeks ago on another matter, and uh, he, you know, he said, yeah, Chris, that's the reason that they do floating zones, because jurisdictions want more control. And that's what happened in King's Contrivance, and I think that's happening in Columbia. I don't say you can do anything you want, but you just have to do it the right way. So that's all for me tonight. Thank you, Chris. Ginny? Yeah, a quick question um, on the Oakland Ridge Industrial Park. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little difficult to read your material uh, here. But the Guilford might be. It's, it's the no, same. No, no, no. Oakland Mills specifically mm -hmm. off 108. Yeah. yeah. Thunder Hill, Long Reach Right, area. right. Yeah. Um, my understanding from some of the owners there was that uh, – the, the, the deeds or the restrictions would expire in 50 years, I think, and that's coming up like this year or something of that sort. Well, so, the deed restrictions are different well, than... Well, cover, the covenants. Yeah. They were concerned well, about actually, the covenants, Well, actually, what too. they all have generally is a automatic renewal. They do expire, I believe, in... Uh, uh, you're right, but there's an automatic renewal unless they are revoked. Okay. 
They seem very concerned about there would be nothing there. At some point. Well, I mean, effectively, there is nothing there right now because whoever is responsible for it is, is basically abdicated their responsibility. Well, they have a, a group of owners of the mm -hmm. properties that are trying to do some enforcement, but you're right, it's not every property owner that's interested. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Question. Um, I'm a little confused. The self-storage we've been talking about, is that in Newtown or is that in M1? That is in M1. That is in a parcel in King's Contrivance. That was platted in 1948, and there was a, a home there, okay? And I'm sure Ralph tried to buy it, and the guy's like, hey, it's my house. Okay, so and then what ended up, what's that? It's outside of right. Newtown. Right, and, but they were also hemmed in, um, which they did quite often. Uh, CA owns the land surrounding the property. And uh, actually, uh, Ralph would do that to kind of control those properties in a way. Okay, thank you. A um, couple more things. Um, the three you, you gave us documents about three business parts, correct? Or yes. Parts. Are these the only three that have that clause in it that no. prevents us? Do all of them, or some um, of them, I, from your point of view? I would say the vast majority of them do, um, except the Rivers Industrial Park, which is over by the Skilford Mini Storage. By that time, CA had been turned over to the owner, the, the residents, okay? And at that time, uh, they ceased putting CA to have the power to enforce because they didn't want to give it that power to them. But the vast majority of them do, yes. Because they, you know, back then, they didn't have word processors, so they just used, you know, the same thing. Um, so how does this, I'm trying to keep all this in, in perspective, the whole Snowden River Parkway thing, where are we with that, and does this connect with this this issue at all? Well, um, I, I would suggest that uh, if owners in that park um, have objections, they are certainly empowered and free to file a lawsuit to enforce the covenants and get injunctive relief. Um, I, uh, I understand they're still moving forward with that, um, and uh, so... Um, they, they, they move, who, who's the, they the, the Royal Farm Store is still moving forward, <laughs> and uh, DPZ is processing it. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, Chris, um, I know you have a lot of, of background in that. So right now, um, with residential properties, um, developers generally come, and there is a process for or there is a public process in place. There are several different steps. And in fact, we've had developers who have come and said, I'm thinking about doing this. We do a little presentation to the village boards. I think everybody has, has been through that kind of thing. But would you be in favor of having a similar kind of process for the small infill properties? Um, for example, there's this M1. Uh, this is really a, a relatively small development, but it is having a huge impact mm -hmm. on a county trail system that is being used by many, many people, not just King's Contrivance, but people all over Columbia because it connects various villages and people are out there. Is that the kind of thing that we, we need legislation to sort of um, shore up that piece and make it more like what we do with residential now? Um. It might be appropriate. I'm all for public notice, and but but I don't I, I don't want to. I'm not for this um, idea that we just talk and talk and talk. It's like here's the public notice. You know, you know, you have to go out and do it. Here's where you can, uh, if you have objections, raise them here in this official forum. If you don't like it, you can appeal. I mean, but right, what happened was there was a movement to include a lot of pre-submission meetings and engage people in a lot of talk, but not actually tell them, well, here's, here's where the time is. It's time to go to, to, to the process here. And uh, I was looking at the Village uh, Center Redevelopment um, uh, flowchart, and there's like 10 places where people can give public input. But, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, and the place at the zoning board which is actually where the game is, 
it's like another, just another place. Oh yeah, you can come in and talk. Well, I, you know, I don't think it's fair to the developer, and I don't think it's fair to the um, residents and other people. You know, here's the process. It's very straightforward, and um, and 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 that's it. Joe. Sure. And Chris, thanks for your document. I think I read your PDF version earlier. And uh, I have two questions. The first question is because they are asking easement between CA and the development, but if CA does not grant their easement, does that mean they need to move the location a little bit to the front of the Gilbert Road? I, I, I'm sorry. I, if, if CA does not grant easement uh, of the land with them, right? Where they need to move that a little that, bit? That, that might be a better question for when we actually get into discussing okay. the site. Okay. Because I mean, Chris has not seen all the documentation. Well, I, and actually, I mean, yeah, yeah, are you yeah. just so I can be He's clear. referring to the storage. Yeah. Right? Oh, okay. Storage. Uh, yeah, Chow, I, I, okay. I, I'm not really prepared to, but okay, thanks good. for the question. So another question from your document is that CA should dispatch a letter to the county executive requesting him to enforce the Planning meaning of the law, or explain why the county is not following the law. So, is that a county government or DPC or any specific department not enforcing the law? Uh, let me just elaborate very briefly. Mm -hmm. Okay, what transpired was in the villages in the downtown, mm -hmm. there were new regulations established for the redevelopment, mm -hmm. and that's what you have to do. And they effectively reset the zone mm -hmm. in the commercial areas outside of Columbia. There are no regulations, okay? The county, in all fairness to them, has people coming up and saying, hey, I'd like to develop here, I'd like to develop there. And I mean, it, it was kind of a workaround, if you wanna know. But in my opinion, they're handling things administratively, i.e. in the department, like with the King's Contrivance mini storage. That's a completely administrative process. That's why there's no notice. And I'm saying it has to be handled legislatively mm -hmm. via the county council. And there's a reason for that, because there's accountability. So if I don't like something, I can go camp out up at the George Howard building and, and yell at the county council people every day or tell them it's great or whatever I want to do. But that's why it's designed like that. And the other reason that it's in the county council's hand, land use is prone to corruption. And so you have to get five people to agree. And the whole idea is that you wouldn't want it vested in the county executive because there would be too much uh, possibility of a breach of the public trust. Thanks, Chris. One, one moment on the dick was. Oh, I'm sorry. I think so. You were saying things to go away. You, you mentioned sorry, this um, M1 zone, and you say there's a lot of different things you can do in that. Uh, I think there's 67 what they call buy rate uses, and that's important. Now, uh, looking at, uh, say, Route 108, where uh, they were talking about putting a used car lot in, mm -hmm. was that a, a valid uh, use of an M1 uh, district? It is a permitted use in M1. But my position is, and my interpretation is, that you can't just tear down a building and put up a used car lot or anything else. You can do that if you want to, but you have to reset the zone. Mm -hmm. And just like you do in the villages, okay? And that creates the accountability and the control. Mm -hmm. And also to avoid situations like we had here in King's Contrivance. And in my opinion, the Department of Planning and Zoning has been handling the NT. Oh, it says M1 on the final development plan. Okay, all 67 uses. Well, I pointed out to them, there's the Bank of America building, which is being auctioned off right now, right by the Wendy's there at the new courthouse. I said, you can have um, um, a mulching operation, you could have a recycling operation, you could have RV storage, and I don't think anyone would want that at the entrance to the courthouse. <clears throat> and I'm not saying you can't do anything. In fact, I think we need to fix it because it's unfair to the owners. The owners need to know too. And as I said, the department did this as a workaround, and that's understandable, but a workaround creates problems sometimes. Yeah, last question, Alan. My, my understanding, and maybe I'm mixing things up from your email, was that you were rebuffed by the Office of Law on this point. What's their argument? Well, they don't have one. Um, um, they, they must think they don't. What's their argument? They, they don't, literally, um, in, in my email to you today, I took a clip from a hearing examiner 
where the Office of Law said there's no regulations. And there aren't. He's right. But he's never addressed that formally. I've requested on numerous occasions, and, and you know, um, I'm, you know I, I, I'm basically ignored. I mean, I'm not trying to be whiny here, but um, <coughs> um, unfortunately, it's never been addressed. And that's one of the reasons I was imploring you just to say, look, address it. And, and if I'm wrong, it won't bother me. I mean, Chris, you're wrong. That's fine. It won't bother me a bit. I mean, I don't want to be wrong, but um, it won't bother me. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Jerry um, Ockerman. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Jerry Uckerman, I've lived in Huntington for the last 25 years, and I'm here for the trail issue, too. Uh, this is, I don't know if this has been mentioned yet tonight, this is the only, this property where it's a four-story self-storage facility, which I've noticed in the, in the nearby Guilford Industrial Park, there's self-storage facilities, and they're all one story or two stories. And, um, but this is the only non-HRD out parcel between Lake Elkhorn and 95, I believe, along uh, the Cushing Branch Trail. Everything else is CA, except for under the power lines, which are uh, BG&E. And then further downriver, the Savage, everything is county, except for the um, one house just uh, downriver from Homer Housing. So, um, this is, uh, uh, this is the only out parcel in that stretch. Um, it seems to me there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. There's been proposals from the community to put the entrance way off Guilford Road so uh, they wouldn't have to use this stretch of old Guilford Road along the river, but uh, that hasn't been acceptable to the developer. And there's also been uh, explanations given that that is um, that that um, the grading is bad. So Jeff proposed the side entrance that would avoid that. And I understand. I talked to somebody at the county a couple of days ago, and they they had some issues with that proposal too. And I'm not really sure I understand that. But I would just ask that one way or the other, the county proposal now is to to um, to um, put another trail in alongside the road and have a grass strip with, with boulders there. And uh, so either way, they're going to come to the CA for permission to do what they want to do. So I would just ask that the, uh, that the CA accept that proposal as a last resort only. Thanks, Jerry. Any questions? Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Ruth Hughes. Ruth, welcome. Thank you. I'm a longtime resident of uh, Phelps Lock, a mother, and a clinical psychologist. And I want to thank you for addressing, uh, adding to your agenda tonight, a discussion of the National Gun Violence Awareness Day uh, for 2018 tonight uh, to the agenda this evening. I truly appreciate, since I was here a couple weeks ago, that many of you have reached out with support and concern about this issue of gun violence in our, our city, in our county, in our nation. Um, I wish more of Howard County's chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America were here this evening, but we're having a membership meeting right now in the Miller's Library where several hundred people will be. So they have let me loose so that I can come and thank you here this evening. This will be the third year that we're celebrating the National Gun Violence Awareness Day, which is supported by hundreds of national and state groups, including a number that are active here in Columbia, uh, Moms Demand Action, Marylanders Against Gun Violence, and Sandy Hook Promise. Orange honors the 96 lives cut short every day, and the hundreds more wounded by gun violence every day, and demands action. Orange expresses our collective hope as a nation, our hope for a future free of gun violence. On Monday, Governor Hogan signed a series of gun bills, making Maryland one of the safest states in the nation from gun violence. But every Marylander and every Columbia citizen is still very much at risk, much more at risk 
here in the United States than we would be in any other industrialized country. Daily, seven children and teens die of gun violence. It has serious ramifications beyond just those people who are killed and injured. Since Columbine, 210,000 children have been in a school that's a, been affected by a, a shooting. Our homicide rate, as you note in your resolution, thank you very much, is 25 times greater, 25 times, than any other industrialized nation. Most other countries have tackled this serious problem, and we can as well. It's in our power to save lives, and tonight I hope you'll make a step by approving the proclamation for Gun Violence Awareness Day. We'll be commemorating this year by asking our local governments to issue a proclamation, as you folks have, um, asking everyone to wear orange um, on June, the weekend of uh, June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And we'll be having a uh, celebration on Saturday, June 2nd, attended by survivors and family members of those affected by gun violence. We're asking religious leaders in Colombia to speak to the issue of gun violence during their services over the weekend. We reviewed the resolution that you folks have drafted, thank you very much, and are very much in uh, um, supportive of that. And so please vote yes to the resolution and help us keep this serious issue in front of Columbia citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Any questions, Jen? Just a quick question. Um, thank you for all the work you and, and other people have done on this issue. Um, did you have find a location yet? I know you were looking at working with CA for Lake Kittimacundi. Did you? Yeah, it, it became really problematic on the lake, mm. partly because of the, the construction of the work that's uh, going to be done there. Um, but so we, we're looking at a series of other locations and are likely to have it at a school. But I, I appreciate your support and mm -hmm. questions about that. Ellen. How do you address, we've heard it said that this proclamation might even have been written, not that it was, but could have been written by the NRA. Yes, and that was Frank's uh, point. Alan, uh, that's really been taken care of. It's yeah. all been fully resolved. And I really do appreciate your response to that. Yeah, the Thank wording you. I, I really don't. I, I, it's I completely that my my concern there have been completely alleviated. The resolution's been um, our resolution was different. Is though. different, yeah. and and I think it's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess where I'm coming from is is it's still uh, I'll support it. And it still feels like offering hopes and prayers and thoughts rather than solutions. So I, that's what I'm. And and, and as a, if I can take a moment to respond to that, as I said to Greg, Moms Demand Action is a bipartisan group, and we are a moderate group. Having said that, we are very activist. I spent many days in Annapolis during the legislative season. We just got four bills um, that were passed that really are very proactive. One uh, 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 protects domestic abuse victims um, so that there now is a, will be a process in place for removing guns from, the, from their homes of anybody convicted of a domestic abuse um, crime. One is a red flag law, so if someone is uh, either suicidal or threatening others with a gun, those guns can be removed from the home. Another is a bump stock ban or any, any device that would act to increase. Um, and there's also funding for training of police officers in response and uh, looking for guns. And so we have a number of, we're very, very proactive. This day is designed to be <coughs> not about the policies. This day is designed to really recognize <coughs> the horrific cost to survivors, family members, people who've been affected by gun violence and be there as a community to support them. So that's why the resolution doesn't address all those things I just talked about. But I want you to know we're there. Ciao, did you have a question? Uh, sure, okay. thanks for your great work. And how many clubs do you have uh, in Howard County, Moms Demand Action? Just one club or you have many smaller clubs? Oh, we have one in every county in Maryland. Mm -hmm. So we have one here mm -hmm. in Howard County. Mm -hmm. um, we have our last meeting, and I'm not at tonight's, but we had more than 200 people show up. Mm -hmm. um, and so our numbers are growing dramatically. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you the number right now, mm -hmm. um, but we have literally growing by leaps and bounds this year. Mm -hmm. 
because this is such a hot topic issue. Mm -hmm. I see. <coughs> so, that, uh, sorry, President, have Jerry have any no, other no. questions for us? Well, yeah, if I could no. just no, for 15 seconds. no, no, I'm the way it works is the no, questions know, are from my hand raised and I'm asking. <laughs> but I fully support what Ruth just said. My daughter's a student at Hamilton, so I've asked about the same thing. Thanks, Ruth. Appreciate thank you very much. Please vote to approve the resolution and thank you for all your support. Next up, we have Ginger Scott. <laughs> Welcome, Ginger. Thank you. I just forgot it last year. Good evening. I'm Ginger Scott, and I live in Wild Lake. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you all on your re-election to the CA board. Your commitment and especially your collegiality are very special. Um, I would like to augment the information Dan Burns shared with you at your work session about the Fairly Hills liquor license. On July 18, 1995, the liquor board held its first hearing on CA's application for a license. Because CA was poorly prepared, a second hearing was held on October 10, 1995. On January 17, 1996, the liquor board issued its decision and order it noted very similar findings of fact and conclusions of law, including the following. To ensure that the granting of the license does not disturb the peace and safety of the neighborhood, the board concludes <coughs> that sales must be limited to beer and light wine, and no sales of alcoholic beverages may be made on the golf course from kiosks or beverage the license was granted subject to four conditions, including the following, that the sales of alcoholic beverages be limited to the clubhouse and patio adjacent to the clubhouse. A day or two before Tom and I met with Milton, Dan, and Nancy on March 29, Tom discovered a copy of the decision and order in our file. We had no recollection of having read it before then, nor have we any recollection of anyone from CA ever having mentioned any restrictions. You may be the first board to know of them. Dan thought this decision in order might have been superseded and said he would check. We were not terribly surprised when we learned at your work session that there was indeed a new reversion, but we were astounded by its date. January 24, 2006. This was a year and a half before Rob Goldman sent the attached memo to the CA Board's Performance Oversight Committee, which was evaluating his request that the Board rescind its own restrictions against selling beer from carts. Nowhere in his memo does Rob mention a new application or request for modification to an existing one. Nowhere does he mention that the resident protected restrictions in the original had been removed. POC Chair Cindy Coyle was determined to let residents know as much as possible about the proposal. Rob seemed equally de determined to provide as little information as possible. Rob is no longer at CA, but while he was there, he had a lot of influence. We are concerned that his mindset may have found a home in the heads of those he left behind. We think a tendency toward obfuscation and withholding of information may have taken root in some of his colleagues. We think the lack of transparency with the presentation of the neighborhood center conversion is a good example of this. Thank you and good night. Thanks, Ginger. Any questions? Thank exactly you. Exactly three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. She knows how to time. Exactly three minutes. The last piece of sand. Did I do it? Did I do it? <laughs>
think that's the first time that's ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Ginger, is, Ginger has testified enough. She knows that three minutes. She's been here before. That's right. Okay, next up we have Joel Horowitz. Joel? Welcome, Joel. Hello. Joel Horowitz, 5681 Harper's Farm Road. So, truth be told, I got interested in the Guilford project with Christiana Rigby, who's back. I guess she's going to speak too soon. Um, so, some things I just want to put on the table for your discussion, and I hope uh, Val and Phil and the council person are listening to my concerns regarding the county's role in some of this. But first, I wanted to thank Milton and Dennis at the uh, community meeting for expressing their willingness and apparently following through and having discussions with the developer about Guilford Road. So I think when that fell through, from what I've read the emails, some other people have talked about the corner entrance, what I would call the east end of the parcel, because the developer at the meeting says he didn't put the entrance there in the floodplain, so therefore they put it at the west side get out of the floodplain. However, to solve that problem, we're now having the county and CA have to participate in putting an impervious surface of much greater length in a lower elevation in the floodplain because of the developer's issue. That I can't find making a lot of logical sense. Um, while I share some of the sentiment, I guess, of the community members who talk about the safety issues. If you go to Bing or Google and look at some of the aerial photos, there are more cars in the trailhead parking lot than probably will be in the storage parking lot. So they, they might have more issues just with their neighbors parking there. The county has said that this is a public road. It might be on the maps, but as some other people have pointed out, there's a barricade that you can find on the Ping Street view, which Google, by the way, didn't go down the street, apparently didn't consider it a road. Um, and as you also pointed out, the, the uh, signage issues I'll get to. Um, so I'm not sure what kind of a public road we have in the county where you put barricades in the middle of the road before a cul-de-sac, and if the county is so concerned about water issues and our water runoff, why do we have a cul-de-sac that apparently was serving no useful purpose? Because you had a barricade, which then made people apparently make three-point turns rather than use a cul-de-sac, which it was intended for. Um, the, so that issue of the trail and the practicalities of how adding more park amenities, you've talked about the signage, it looks like a park. When you drive into it, it looks like a park. You add a walkway, it looks more like a park. How are people going to find the entrance to this thing when they miss the little sign that says Old Guilford Road? So if they come to CA asking for a sign at the corner, I assume from way Milton was at the committee meeting, that was not something that you were really willing to give them. So that's just the issue of the practicalities of this from the point of view of CA, from the community taking over this road as a... Uh, trail space over the years. Um, I also add, since you brought up the M1, there are a lot of confusing things about the parcels. On your map, you have the snake-like parcel on the west is labeled as M1, owned by CA. I don't know what is going on with that. That is not NT, according to the county. Just to add to the confusion of things going on in the area. Thanks, Joel. Joel, what was the last thing you just said? Say it again slowly. On the map? If you go to the map, do you have the map? Yes. In the presentation? That little snake-like parcel near the houses? Yeah. It, so that, that comes up as M1 on the county's website owned by CA. And it seems to attach to the M1 parcel that is apparently the uh, utility right-of-way to the west. So I don't understand, can't be M1, you can't build on it. One, it's in the woods, it's too thin to build on, it's owned by CA, so I'm not sure what's going on with why it's not NT. If anybody has an answer to that, I'm... Thanks, Joel. Next up, we have Lou Ship. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be back again. Yeah. 
I'll just add a little bit to what, what I said last week about the golfers and the golfing and the, and the sale of, of uh, alcohol from the carts. Um, my dear friend, Ms. Scott, and that's true, uh, has, has repeatedly made the point that Fairway Hills is different than Hobbit's Glen because the owners bought those lots at, how, at uh, Fairway Hills not knowing the golf course was going to be built there. So I took advantage of Google Maps and the SDAT Maryland.gov database and did a little, a little digging. And turns out that there are 79 houses on Pen Mill, Whetstone, Darting Bird, Down West, mm -hmm. Flower Tuff, Star Split, Stone, which are lovely, Stone Brook Row, and Reedy Brook that border the golf course. 20% of those are still in the hands of the original owners. 67 of those have changed hands since the existence of the golf course became public knowledge. And in fact, of, of those 53 homes that have changed, many of them have changed, changed hands several times since 1992. So two thirds of the houses are occupied by people who knew the golf course was there when they bought the home. Thanks, Lou. So Any I questions? Got, I thought I didn't take three minutes. No. <laughs> um, uh, see Jen uh, Hayashi. <laughs> Welcome, Jen. <laughs> Every once in a while, I, I get lucky. Thanks. Broken watches, right? <laughs> um, We've I'm been Jen. sending him to school, you know, strong. <laughs> I am Jen Hayashi. Um, I live on Whetstone Road, actually a couple doors down from Ginger. Um, I am one of those two thirds of the the houses that have turned over since the golf course became public knowledge. I've lived there for about eight years now. Um, we moved in knowing that it was a golf course. Um, it never occurred to me the presence or absence of a beverage cart on the course. Um, I love having the golf course in my backyard. It's beautiful terrain. It's wonderful to see people walking through there. It's funny to watch the golfers <laughs> that are having good days sometimes. <laughs> um, and I mean, sometimes they're, they get frustrated. I hear them say things sometimes without the beverage cart being on the grounds. This is, this is what people do when they golf. Um, I golf a little bit. I'm not really good enough to be on that course because <coughs> one of those nice marshals that Ken talked about would probably come and chase me away because I'm too slow. Um, but I think that for the most part, as the experience um, in the other golf courses in the county and throughout the country, as far as I've heard from other testimony. Um, golfers are there to golf. They're not there to get falling down drunk and be gross. And they don't want to play any worse than they already do play. So I don't think the uh, beverage cart is going to lead to increased um, bad behavior or the um, issues that, that people are concerned about. That's all Thanks, Jen. Any questions? Oh, thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Next up, we have uh, Bill Harris. Welcome, Bill. Hi, thank you. I'm a resident of Long Reach, and I am also the vice chair of the Green Committee for Columbia Association, which is a golf-related uh, committee. Just wanted to say thank you for uh, considering our uh, request for SIN, the, uh, the ban on beverages on the cart. We think it's going to be a great uh, public service to the golf community. I literally just got off the golf course, I finished birdie birdie. And uh, there are about a dozen or so folks who uh, were raising a pint and uh, asked that we express uh, our thanks. And there are about five or six residents here in the audience. So a nice swath of the audience is also here to uh, share their opinions. So I just want to say thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Any questions? Thank you, Bill. Uh, next up, uh, Whitney Schreiber. 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 Sorry. I'm married. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, I came here tonight to talk about the neighborhood issue because how it was presented to me is that eight of the 14 centers would uh, were up for closure within the next several years. It sounds like the other residents spoke about that. That may not be the case, so there's confusion going on here. But the reason that I came out tonight is because my daughter attends a, co a cooperative school, a co-op, <coughs> Um, in one of the neighborhood centers, and it's our neighborhood center, so we get to walk there every day. 
and it's awesome. We love the school. We love the fact that it's a co-op. Um, that's the type of environment that we wanted for her. I read in the meeting um, minutes, notes, I'm not sure what the um, correct term is, but one of the concerns was the rise in dual income households and that co-ops weren't being used as much. Um, I'm not going to tell you whether we're dual income or not because it doesn't matter. That's the kind of um, environment that we wanted for our kids. When we moved into the neighborhood, um, I don't remember if I said we're in the Running Brook neighborhood, but when we moved in, we had about five families in the neighborhood who were like, you got to send your kid to this preschool. They are awesome, including the lady who sold me the house. Like, I don't think that we had closed yet, and she's like, this is where you go. They're amazing. They're wonderful. You can walk there. Um, and so it sounds like it may not be as eminent. Like, people don't need to freak out that they may be closing immediately. But I would encourage the board then to think about if there's this much pushback, just with that little bit of information, sure, it may have been misinformation, but how important these neighborhood centers are to people and are to the residents of Columbia. Like, I know when my husband and I were house shopping, that's one of the things that we really liked about Columbia was the design, the neighborhood feel, the fact that our house, we can walk to so many things. We have the 7-Eleven, we have the pool, we have the elementary school, we have the co-op. We can walk to the mall, we can walk to the um, parks. These are things that Columbia was built on. And we really like that. We like the ideals of Columbia, and that's why we chose to buy here um, and pay the CPRA versus, <laughs> uh, versus like North Laurel or Anne Arundel County or other elegant city, things like that. That's what we really loved about Columbia. And so I came here to kind of fight for her neighborhood <laughs> center, but it sounds like I may not need to do that. Although we did raise the rally. I emailed like our whole neighborhood. <laughs> and like it was, I, I'm a fighter for my kid. Um, but I would just really encourage you to think about what makes Columbia so special. Like that's why we bought here. That's what we love about it. So please think about that. We love the co-ops and that's not common to find nowadays. Um, and a lot of these co-ops and other small businesses in the neighborhood centers rely on the space available with the specific type of budget. I know that they're not necessarily fiscally making a lot of money, but at the same time, we do bring in money. Like our co-op had, was it three fundraisers this month, guys? Mm. Um, we support the local businesses. Like we went to the Play and Learn, we went to BJ's Brewhouse last night, we went to Kava. Those were all this month. Um, and so I know that there's like, if the neighborhood centers are going to close, am I out? Almost. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but I would encourage you to consider sure. that too. Um, what was my other point that they were specifically designed and that Running Brook especially is just, it's doing what it was designed to do. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, Whitney. Um, Alan. Would you? Do me and perhaps us, but I can only speak for me right now, a favor, and email the people you emailed before. <laughs> <laughs> and just and, and it's not about saying, don't worry, don't be active, let us do all the thinking. Far from it. But let them know that nothing is going to happen until there is a thorough, inclusive process. We're nowhere near a decision. The community is going to be involved. <clears throat> I will. I did read through the notes, and to me, it did read like, the centers, it, it's cost prohibitive. We are looking to close them. So just as an FYI. That was that was staff's recommendation. That doesn't mean the board has approved it. So we're, and we're just at the that. very beginning of a process. Jenny. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if um, it would be helpful if CA were to send a process memo to people like you that you could then send to everybody. That would be exactly fantastic. what the process is. So that there's no misunderstanding at all. This is the process we're going to use. This is what's happened so far. This is what's going to happen after that. So that there's no misunderstanding uh, in either way. Because uh, uh, I'm, I'm concerned if we don't do something in writing, <clears throat> would that be possible? We'll think about it. We'll, think, I, I we'll take it under yeah. consideration. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Nicole uh, Huber. Yep. Um, 
Welcome, Nicole. Please, please, Hi, please. Uh, I'm Nicole Huber, and I'm asking Whitney to sit here with me. I'm hard of hearing, and I actually left one of my hearing aids at home tonight. So I'm working on one ear, and she will be my other ear. Um, I'm here tonight to also speak on the same subject. I understand that you're saying that it may not be something we have to really be this passionate about, but this is how much we're concerned about it. Even a small hint of a talk about it is enough to bring a bunch of pretty tired parents here tonight. Um, I moved here from the Philippines, my family and I, and Singapore in 1990. Um, we lived in Owen Brown, and I eventually found a job at the Owen Brown Village Center working at a video store that is now defunct. Um, my mom worked at the library. Uh, to us, this is what made Columbia unique. Um, it, in the Philippines, there are no neighborhood centers like this, and in Singapore, it's the same thing. Um, I've been a journalist in Florida and in California and in the DC area. This is very unique. Uh, this is a very unique thing for a community and for um, a place of education for us. Uh, our school, Running Brook Children's Nursery, has been around for 50 years. And our teacher, Mrs. Joe, has been there for 30 years. We have students whose parents actually also attended this co-op. Um, so this is a, a very precious thing for us, and it should be actually celebrated even more in Colombia. We are a very, very diverse group. Uh, my daughter has graduated from Running Brook, and my youngest son is currently there. The parents of the graduating class that, that I was involved in, almost all of us now have gone on to volunteer in public schools in Howard County, because that is what co-op parents are trained to do. We are trained to be very involved. We are, are trained to assist teachers. We are trained to know the students and the names of our, our children's classmates. That is what a co-op is. It is a very special thing. When I think of Columbia, I don't think of all these new businesses that I see in front of the mall. I don't even think of all these chain restaurants. That's just a regular thing. I can drive to Gatesburg and see all that stuff. What makes Columbia beautiful and unique are the neighborhood centers. And they're not there for revenue, because how can you put money on communities getting together, on immigrants like me who come to this country and see other people, on, a, on the service places that we can go to, and it doesn't matter what religion you are, or co-ops that are extremely diverse and affordable, like our school is. So this is not about revenue. Neighborhood centers are for everyone. Not everyone can afford to join Supreme Sports Club or all the other places in Columbia, but the neighborhood centers are indeed for everyone. You know, we, there's a whole bunch of us here. I don't know if everyone will get a chance to talk, and I understand that this, again, may not be something that you guys proceed with, but I just want to give you a hint, a little hint of the fight. <laughs> that we will all put up, <laughs> and I hope other co-ops join us, if indeed you go forward with this. Um, we're a pretty vocal group. I'm a former journalist, so it, it's not hard to put together some packets, send to the media, we'll come up with a hashtag. I mean, we'll be, we will truly, to be honest with you, be the biggest pain in your asses. Um, we do invite you to our school. We'd like for you to come visit us anytime. We would like to you know, show you around, show you what our school that has been around in this town for 50 years, uh, what this means to us, and what it can mean to future generations. Your vision is making Columbia the community of choice today and for generations to come. So give generations to come something to live here for, right? So anyways, we hope you join us and you know, reconsider this or completely take it off your table. That would be Thank great. you. <laughs> Next, I, I think it's Peter Barnes. Oh, thank you. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. My name is Pete Barnes. I'm also here to talk about the, the Tuxen Trail and um, really just to ask questions of you all uh, as to what's been done. We hear a lot of different stories as far as CA offering concessions to the developer. Can I first ask if that was done to give the land the open space for the front entrance 
for free. Was that done for the developer? Just, we're going to have a presentation. Yeah, we're going to have a presentation oh, later. So, yeah. and, and, Again, and that can't happen unless the board approves it. Right. So board it, ha would it have has to not happened. Anything like that. If, okay. if it was so even it thought to happen, now. it hasn't okay. happened. It hasn't happened. So it feels like that we're at this point because that didn't happen way early on. And they've already engineered their drawings and done everything to say they can't do it now. But what we're saying here as a group of over 2,500 people that have signed the petition to change this to the front entrance is a pathway is not acceptable on the back of this path where kids, dogs, and everybody bikes through right now. There's already barriers there that show that this is not a road. The county has already put barriers there to show that this is a pathway. And at the intersection there, at the end of the uh, cul-de-sac. So to say it's a road is just false. And to look at that mission behind you and take a look at it, maybe read it again, what you're doing is not in line with letting them do this as a group. You should be a lot angrier. This is your trail. This is your community. I'm sure most of you go on this trail, whether it's this portion of the trail or another portion, you wouldn't want to stay in your backyard. I'm on this trail every day, and again, I have a personal interest, but <coughs> if you look at this, it says for generations to come. Generations to come will have to deal with a mini storage traffic, trucks coming in and out of a trail, which you cannot replace that trail to go to Savage or Columbia. It connects the two communities, and if you're looking at that and not protecting it for your citizens, then you're doing your citizens harm. Mm -hmm. And safety and all the aesthetics besides, you just gotta look for your vision and see how you can correct this and move this entrance to the front, not accept the back. You can still do it, the building has not been built. And the question is, is the next step, the only step that we have to take is to pressure the developer? Is that basically the only thing we have left as a community? I have to wait till our. You have to wait. <laughs> well, anyway, that, thank you very much. I just wanted to make thank that a public statement. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, next up, we have uh, Christina Rigby. Welcome, Christine. Uh, thank you, Mitch. Um, so I um, came for I guess for two reasons. One to talk about the trail on Old Guilford. Um, my name is Christina Rigby. I don't know if I need to give you my address, but I live in Kingston Drive, and I also serve. Um, on the village board there. And um, I wanted to ask that in the future when CA is approached about properties like this, if the village board had been notified back two years ago, I think that we would be in a very different position now because we would have served as advocates informing the residents of what was happening. And you know the solutions could have been research much sooner because now we're at the point where we're years in and and that's really making the process difficult um, because the developers already spent so much money we have no leverage he doesn't have much of an incentive um, to change the project so I'd ask that I don't know what the technical process is but that when CA is approached with these types of projects that the village boards are notified because that should be you know part of our purpose um, and then lastly, I wanted to talk just briefly about the neighborhood centers. <laughs> um, I am a Dasher Green Duck graduate, um, and my daughter is now at ECP, which is the new name of, of the Dasher Green Ducks. Still ducks, though. Um, and I know it's different because we're a community center in Owen Brown. Um, but those neighborhood centers and those co-ops, they provide the first entree into community for so many families in Howard County. And, and especially, I mean, my parents were original owners off Hickory Log Circle. They were original owners off McGill's. My sister moved to Stevens Forest. I moved to Kingston Tribe, and I'm like a mile and a half by the path, through this path, actually, through Guilford Road is how it, I would get to <laughs> my parents' house. Um, and it's because Columbia is really special, and those co-op centers and the neighborhood centers are really what make Columbia, Columbia. Um, and some of you know um, that I am also running for county council, but the one thing I wanted to say about that is that when I'm at the doors, 
this is one of the number one issues I hear from people in Columbia about. They're like, what's going on with the neighborhood centers? How can we stop this? Um, <laughs> and, and I think that you can see how important they are to the heart of Columbia just based on the response from them. And I know it's early in the process, um, but I just, I just couldn't let it go unnoted because they are that important. And thank you for the nice words for oh, that. Oh, I've got nothing else to <laughs> yeah, Hi, thanks for coming in, really. Sure, sure. Um, one statement you made, you said, when CA becomes aware of things, essentially we need to do a better job of talking to the village boards. Do you? My timer's up, that's why. That's okay. Do you think that happened in this case? Because I haven't heard that we got any word about what the developer was doing. So well, I, I don't know if there's any any basis to suggest that somehow CA didn't communicate. So the developer said that they had approached CA, so that's like Dennis and Milton um, previously, and then I think you had reached out back to them to offer some solutions. No, no, no. Okay. No, no. no. Sorry, I was at the Hammond meeting. That's what I had written down. You had sent them, replied they, to them, and they didn't reach back If out. I may, they approached us. Sure. We, po we posed to, and they, when they approached us, they didn't even come to us to talk about uh, an easement across okay. from uh, Guilford Road. They came to talk to us as we were showing the PowerPoint later on. Sure. Utility easements. Okay. We brought up the idea of possibility of Guilford Road, and they had already done their homework with the grade and the utilities, and that was off the mm -hmm. table. After we talked to them, we we reached out to them and say, "Are you coming back to us?" And we never heard from them again. Well, and that's the opportunity where it's like. Then we could have helped. But that's, there's not a process there. So why are we reaching out to the village? There's not a process involved. That's my point. Maybe we need to create one. <laughs> okay, but just to straight, that was not years ago before. I think this is very recent. Yes, it was so last within year. the last year and a half. When I think no, it was, it was like within the last. March 6, 2016. It was March 6, yes. Yeah. So yeah, that's we're, the we're first time they reached out to yes, you. Yes, we're going to have a briefing that's going to cover all this. Um, so. The only reason I have yeah. that is because when the village board replied to them, they said they reached out to CA nine or ten months ago. Um, so that's, I think that's possibly the error of confusion, but I think most people who are engaged with Columbia know that we do have a lot of, um, that infill and other issues are really coming up more and more, and so maybe as we become aware, I mean, we have the development tracker, but for these commercial properties that are smaller, that are more ensconced, I think when we talk about infill, I, I think that there's room for a process to be created to engage, um, engage the community more. We can be that, you know, we can facilitate. Thanks, Christina. Um, Kelly uh, Wanda? Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. W which um, village do you live in? Can I'm you? in, um, sorry. Please, in, in Boston, because I was patiently waiting. Um, I'm part of the Violet Village. Okay, sure. So I kind of just wanted to take just a few seconds to say um, my son gave up his soccer practice this evening because he knew how important that school was because that school was so important to him that he felt he needed to come out and support the teacher who um, runs that school. So I am now learning that things are progressing into you know maybe not happening so much so, but um, I just wanted to say that I thought it was really important that my child's voice was heard. He hasn't been to bed so he's not here anymore. <laughs> but um, I just wanted I wanted to give him kind of a lesson as to how our clubs and our public works work and also be able to say that um, you know our voice matters and so I just wanted to say that. So thank you very much for Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Um Alan? Um thank him for us for coming out. <clears throat> Was he planning on speaking or just in the future? And I'm speaking just for myself, but I think I'm gonna get support. Let us know, and we can bump him or other people like that to the head I've of the line. Never been to a, this before, I understand. So I, know how it works. So I understand. Like my dad talked to me today, and he's like, "You probably have to put your name in and tell them ahead of time that you're going to speak to them." And I was like, "Oh, this is no good." <laughs> <laughs> so then I saw people signing up, and I was like, "Oh, I guess I have to get my name on it." So had I known that was the case, it would have been a lot earlier. But I didn't know that I had to sign in. So, but again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Kel. Uh, and last, uh, Bob Summers. Summers. Good 
Ich warte mal. Thank you. Um, I live in Wild Lake on uh, 10 Mills Road on one of the large percentage that we ship mentioned as bordering the golf course. Uh, I'm thrilled to border the golf course. My house backs up to the 12th hole. My wife and I thoroughly enjoy the view, thoroughly enjoy the neighborhood. We have no issues with the golfers at all. We know many of them. Uh, my dogs know many of them. And, <laughs> it, it's, it's, and, and I, I do apologize. I'm coming at, uh, off of a uh, bout of laryngitis, and I'm also from Boston. I don't apologize for being from Boston. <laughs> but I've lived here for 20 years, and it's been delightful. Uh, my wife and I play golf. We play golf frequently at Fairway Hills. Okay? I know a lot of people there, and it's a, the, probably the most welcoming group of people I've ever been involved with, and I'll play golf all over the, the country. Okay, so it's a very, very positive experience. I happen to wear another hat, okay? About three years ago, I started working at Fairway Hills two days a week in the pro shop. I sell beer. I also drink beer, okay? I do that when I play golf. Okay? Thank you. I'm pretty sure any studies that you did on the amount of beer that would be consumed if you start selling it on a beer cart would be minimum compared to what I sell already in the pro shop. People come in and quite frequently they say, will there be a cart gal or somebody out there selling a beverage, particularly in the summertime when it's warm? I say, yeah, you can get Gatorade or you can get water and maybe a snack. Usually the reaction is, huh? You mean they don't sell beer? You sell beer here? And I say, yeah, it makes no sense. Okay, I have no explanation for it. Okay, but that's the way it is. Okay? It's very confusing. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't be buying any more beer from the golf person on the cart as they are from me in the pro shop. Okay, I'm totally in favor of it. Thank you, Bob. Any questions, Alan? Uh, born in Worcester, raised in Wayland. <laughs> just so you know, the Red Sox are ahead five to three. Just thinking okay. they won. <laughs> Wayland, yeah. good talent. I ran through there a couple of times, running the Boston Marathon. Wonderful yeah. talent. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Okay, that completes uh, the whole sign up I have for Resident Speak Out. Okay, so move on. Um, Milton, if you could. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, Chairman's remarks. Um, it's in writing. Um, I just wanted to add. Uh, thank you for the Long Reach Indoor Tennis grand yeah. opening. It was very nice. I got a chance to go out there, and I know a couple of others. And I want to thank Janet for some nice words. She said, uh, uh, welcoming the tennis uh, facility to Long Reach. I also got to attend the Sister Cities program Saturday. It was quite good, and I hope you were able to at least stop by for, for a little bit. Had a good crowd there. Um, I want to thank Milton and Jeremy and um, CA for the uh, EPA award they got for energy. That was really, very, very nice, very good. Um, we'll have to make sure that gets out. <laughs> and lastly, um, I uh, got an opportunity to attend the uh, chamber event uh, this morning, the breakfast, where they had the county execs from Montgomery County, Howard County, and Anne Arundel County. Um, who did a panel discussion, and it was quite interesting. Um, all three of them are, are very good speakers, um, but a lot of good things. And, of course, as, as I alluded to in my notes, thank you all for your service for this past year, and you know, look forward to another year. Okay, Milton, anything you want to... Well, if I may, just oh, yes. one Oops, point sorry. on your list. Yeah. Uh, on Andy's list, he has uh, the athletic club closes for renovations. He has April 30th. That's the athletic club actually closes on April 29th at the end of the day. At the end of, I think it's around nine o'clock, April 30th, it will be closed. So I don't want anyone to think it will be <laughs> open on the 30th. We'll find out. Party at noon, too. <laughs> anybody has to know about that. Okay, Milton, <laughs> President's report. Any questions for Milton? It was also submitted in writing. Yes, Jen. I did not specific to report, but I did see that one page uh, handout in the flyer that had all the CA information and all the email addresses, and, and I thought that was a great idea. 
I don't know if you're familiar. I meant to bring it with me so I could show you what I was talking about. But it just it was a one pager in the flyer, and it had tons of information about like who you need to contact in CA, and I thought that was okay. excellent. Okay. Um, oh. but, um, in the past, we've asked for both the things that are working well and the things that are not working as well to be in the report. So I'm curious, what in here would you point to as the thing you're least pleased with? Least? Yeah. A report. I don't put things in there that I'm least pleased with. <laughs> <laughs> that was a request that was made of you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up, uh, we have the report from um, Inner Arbor. Any questions? It was submitted in writing. Okay, we're going on to the financial reports. None. Okay, Go on to CA dashboard. One, one question oh, on it. Real quick. Uh, Lynn, uh, any, anything future, anything happening on the Butterfly Building at this point? Uh, no. Okay. Well, on to the CA dashboard. Yeah. Milton, anything you want to? Susan, you want to cover the dashboard? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, you, uh, hopefully you saw the um, corrected version that was reposted on Tuesday, I believe it was, or on the 24th. And I apologize for the error in metric number four. Um, so uh, we continue to track the metrics, uh, the financial metrics one. Um, through seven, and um, you can see we, uh, some seasonality and things like the people productivity moving with uh, when the organization is most fully staffed. It's pretty clear. Um, the the free cash flow metric does show that we will be um, in a negative position at the end of the year, and we are on the using the line of credit now for um, mainly to to pay for capital projects. Um, and, and one of the points that we always like to emphasize is that, yes, it shows a negative, but we only borrow to pay for capital projects. Right. We don't do not borrow for operating costs. Uh, let's see. Um, the, uh, the advertising of uh, effectiveness, pay, and uh, please stop me if you have any questions. I'm moving quickly because it's later, but. Um, so we we have continued to scrub the market share numbers. We excluded um, the employee memberships. Um, we could not. Uh, we for, they were not. They have not been tracked historically by the people's actual address, either a, a resident or non-resident. So uh, we just took them all out. So we know that that um, presents a slightly poorer picture, but um, we thought that was better than overstating them. I guess um, we'll be expecting an updated number from the county on household units, um, hopefully soon, to correct to make that clear. Um, and then I think um, Dan. I don't know if Dan would step out, but um, so the Claridge <coughs> results. I can get him. But this is this is this. He's sorry. right there. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. So uh, if you, um, this is the <laughs> January survey. So. Yeah, so this, it's sort of in January and covers the time, the 90 days before that, so we're running. There's a lot of lag in, in the surveys. Um, another set of solid solid metrics. Um, most facilities were up or fairly consistent with where they were with regard to the net promoter, uh, with the exception of the swim center uh, of the pools. Um, uh, the swim center is generally viewed a little less favorable than even the outdoor pools. The outdoor pools have a very high net promoter, so we take those out. After the season, the, swim, the, the aquatics net promoter tends to, to dip a little bit. Um, generally, they were happy with the renovations there. Feedback on the women's locker room, we've all, we've all heard it. Um, that uh, there are things they thought we could have done better. So we heard that. And if you look up in the top upper right-hand corner with the word cloud, um, the two red things are room and men and room and women, the locker room. Uh, that's generally what we hear about it at most facilities, um, and that's one of the reasons we, we've been focusing on those. We just finished the one in Supreme, which got uh, good feedback, um, and that's a big focus of the renovation at the athletic club. Um, those are the, the main highlights. Um, any questions? Great. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dan. Um, I definitely appreciate the, the net. Promoter score numbers, but that concerns me on the swim 
from the pool piece, that's essentially we're looking just at the swim center there. We've made pretty significant investments mm -hmm. in the swim center and we're going down. I mean, are we, what, I guess well, to... That's consistent for the swim center. It's about, it's about the same. Well, that's not good. Uh, yeah, no, but I'm, it's not going down, it's staying the same. Okay, excuse <laughs> me. Well, I mean, it's down, okay, so that, but that, so this 12 point drop, you're just saying it's sort of that's like... That's because we took out the, because there's no outdoor pools in there. Okay, well, so I guess, I guess... We look at the swim center by itself, each period over period. I guess my concern is we, we've made these millions of dollars investments. We're not done yet. I guess it would be my expectation that we even if we, if we were looking at the swim center alone, the net promoter score would start going in the right direction. Yes. Um, the biggest challenges we have, there are two challenges there. Um, everybody wants the pool to be hotter. Um, and so that's one challenge that unless we decide to change the pool temperatures, um, we're going to continue to get that pushed back because that's we have so many different groups that mm -hmm. go through that those two pools. Um, it's challenging, and um, then we we've had some some challenges as you all know with the locker room renovations. Um, there's the, the size of the shower stalls, and then we have the mechanical issues with the, the handles that we have contracted to get fixed. Um, so. We really haven't had a good test yet for it um, to get those fixed. So uh, it is something we've talked about. Corey, Marty, and I have met and discussed it. Um, it's the same thing when we peel apart tennis. Um, the tennis score is typically <coughs> low because of Owen Brown, but we have opportunity to improve at the athletic club as well. So we do peel them apart and work on them. Mm -hmm. um, related to, to that, so, so just so I'm clear, Two, two things. So under pool NPS, that is only the swim center that doesn't include people's comments about the pool at Supreme or the pool at The majority, the, those focus on, because um, uh, those check-ins will fall under, because you check into Supreme. So it'll fall under Supreme. Now when we look at comments, then we can filter out comments that way, but the net promoter re refers to the facility. Okay. And the down 12 points is 12 points from what to what? It's from the previous quarter survey, which so, would have been in October. Which, which would have included summertime? Is yes, that okay? It, it, it's a 90 day window. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, Susan, I just had a, a quick question. There were two things that sort of jumped out at me from the dashboard. The metric three about people productivity. Mm -hmm. um, from 99.6 to 97.6 to 84.9. Um, what, what would account for that drop? So that reflects the, so quarter one is May, June, and July when we have our fully staffed for outdoor pools. So that's when the personnel related costs are the highest for the organization. Um, but then the revenue is pretty much um, spread over the 12 months but that so that's a peak in the cost which makes that number higher so it's just the seasonality of the of the staffing okay so so that's mm -hmm. a, a rise and a dip that you've seen before you can you can see like if you look the first number there is q3 um, fy17 so so that is q3 fy18 is slightly lower but it's it's <clears throat> it's not at 99 so we see that seasonality uh, in, and it's due to the so this this ratio is total personnel cost total personnel expenses divided by non um, annual charge revenue so if that numerator those personnel costs go up which they do in the summer for Columbia Association this num this ratio percentage goes higher okay all right thank you and the other question that I had is under advertising effectiveness reports and under new memberships so I was just looking at package plan and package plan plus fit and play memberships. So those numbers have varied greatly from FY17 to FY18. Um, in each quarter, there's a significant shift down. Um, again, so what what do you see trending there, or or what uh, uh, accounts? For that, if you compare FY17 first quarter to FY18 first quarter, 
so and then do that from right. all of 17 to 18. So what, what that reflects is, a, it's a lot of things. One is the um, extreme popularity of the other memberships. Um, if you see, they went from 907 to 1523, so that's the, you know, we added a lot of value to the play membership and, and didn't increase the, the cost at all. And um, also, it's just we uh, have had challenges communicating the value of the CA Fit and Play membership and, and, and other factors. So, but like you can see, there's significant increase in the, in the other memberships. Okay. Okay. So the other memberships is not, um, is not the full cost of that, of the Fit and Play. It's, it's not the full cost and not the full value or benefits <coughs> either. It's the play memberships and um, single single club memberships and golf memberships. It's everything but the, the CA. Okay, so it's more of a menu type of membership where people are going for a particular activity rather than a whole smorgasbord mm -hmm. of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Great. Yeah, um, on that page at the bottom with the membership market share data, okay, um, <clears throat> what this shows is that since the end of 2017 to the end of Quarter three, 2018, a loss of 428 memberships, net loss of 428 memberships. That's a drop about almost 3.4%. Um, the top comment we had from people, I don't know if they're top comment, it means they're prioritized, but at least one of the comments you include on, on the couple pages later is that members feel all fees are too high. Um, I mean, whatever, I'm a broken record, but I, I just can't let this go. Is staff considering making any changes or recommending looking or is at least looking at uh, what we're charging folks and making our um, facilities and programs more accessible cost-wise. Mm -hmm. We've we reviewed our data. We, we used on a regular basis the same work team that worked on the um, membership restructure. We kept that group together and we review and we track the membership. Um, and we have these conversations and we're looking at what things may need to be done. Um, we're, we're looking at where the data trends um, with the new sales team in place. We're seeing different trends in the, in the sale of the memberships. Um, we've seen a, seen a dramatic increase in the number of fit and play memberships being sold. Um, so that we're, we're, we're looking at a lot of things. Uh, we had your list that you presented at the budget hearing. Um, that we're examining those options as well and see how that would impact membership. We're looking at our membership policies, not just the, the membership structure and the rate. I mean, we're looking, we look at it all and we're trying to figure out what all the different pieces are. I don't, I, I, no matter what we do, members are always going to think that the fees are too high. That doesn't mean you don't do anything. But I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. Right. I'm saying that that's, but there's, there's a lot more to it than just just because they say they're high doesn't mean that's the only thing wrong. Right. We can lower the rates and still not change anything. So we are trying to examine all the moving parts because there are a lot of moving parts to it and really try to surgically dig in and figure out what needs to be fixed. So we are looking at it. We look at peeling it all apart layer by layer, whether it's the way the memberships are being communicated, whether they're being sold, whether the programming is creating the value we need. Um, if you look at this survey, um, is it on here? I'm getting old. I can't see. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at main areas of conversation, this is one of the first ones where uh, fees and pricing is not the top two things that we talked about. It's number three. Um, so as we continue to add value, so is it price? Is it value? A little bit of both. Um, we just want to make sure we do the right thing. Um, Right, and we're going into a phase where we're going to close one of our gyms for six months. Okay, we're going to have, you know, obviously we, there's going to be some aggravation there. And I'll just say, I know you're looking at this, but, you know, we, it, it would just, you know, really bother me if we lose a significant number of memberships because people are annoyed. And we haven't done something to try to compensate for that and keep, keep these members. It's so hard to get a, a member back once you've lost them. I know you know that. But, um, um, to me, this is a real challenging period during the six months where we've lost a facility. Because not only do you lose a facility, but your other two facilities get a lot more crowded. Mm -hmm. So again, you get people there that are aggravated as well. Yeah. I know you know all this, but it's like, man, the, it, 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 it would just love, it, 
just just do it, even to look at costs, some way to retain these people, keep them happy and pleased during this six months, and, and looking forward to the way it's, the way it's going to be when we're finished. Mm -hmm. yeah. The staff, you know, uh, Leslie and Vicki did a presentation last time about all, all the work mm -hmm. that's been done. Right. Uh -huh. um, the other two facilities have been staffing up, are prepared to treat all the members and engage them. One of the reasons we moved all of the classes so that everybody's going to be spread out and they're not all trying to squeeze into the same same space all the time. Um, the, the staff have worked very hard to accommodate everyone because we know it's going to be difficult. We know May is going to be difficult because everyone's got to find a new schedule. So we're, we're overstaffing the clubs in May to make sure we can accommodate and treat everybody well and make sure we find, help them find what they want. Um, because we know that's going to be a tough time. Then when we get back to the October time frame as this is wearing down, people are going to be ready to go home. And it's also going to start getting cooler out, so then the, the low traffic that we normally see in the summer will start picking back up again. So we're, we're prepared for, for handling this. And does that mean that everyone's going to be overly excited about it? No, we know people are going to be disrupted. Staff is going to be disrupted. I've talked to many staff members as well as members. Yeah, and the disruption is one thing, but the comment I worry about is the one I'm not getting what I paid for, right? And when people signed up for fit and play, they signed up for, you know, three facility, three gym facilities, and and um, some people, for example, signed up maybe for the therapy pool. Anyway, I, I, that that comment stings stings me a bit, and I just want to make sure that we're we've considered addressing it with, you know, again, I'm not the marketing guy. I don't know how to do this the right way, but at least. To give people a break, so they feel like okay, I'm not just being asked to pay for two thirds of what I signed up for, you know. Anyway. All right, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. So then I have a question about the advertising effectiveness report, and uh, I look at the numbers: cost of a new membership acquisition from one percent, one hundred percent to six percent. So cost increase dramatically over 70%. And before I ask other questions, I wonder when the new families move into Colombia, how many, what kind of percentage they actually purchase our membership? Do you know that number? So so the way this this report is not, that's not, the, it, what it, what those percentages talk about is there are the assumptions. Like if we assume that 100% of the um, new memberships were driven by the advertising tactics, then this would be the cost per membership. Mm -hmm. If we assume that 90% of the memberships mm -hmm. were driven by these tactics, it would be this, and so mm -hmm. on down to 60. So these are these are assumptions to show um, the range mm -hmm. of variable in 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 how the how uh, what drives the membership decision. I see. So my my question, for example, for new families moving to Colombia, for example, when I purchase a house and here I was thinking which kind of gym I may join, right? Mm -hmm. What the percentage of people actually who Purchase our membership when they move new to Columbia. Do you know that? Yeah. Alan, did you hear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Jen. I, I, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, still. I just want to comment that I think especially when we try to attract members for the new families move in, that's a very important first step to attract them. Yes. Right. Instead, for right. example, I keep getting the message or the advertisement from Baltimore Sun. I'm a member already, right? I keep getting advertisement every day when I read like Baltimore Sun or anything like Facebook. I think they touch the wrong people, right? I'm not sure how they find me because I'm a member already. I mean, how effective that the advertising company are doing their work? I doubt that. So I want to see how you evaluate their performance to reach out to real customers, not, not like myself. Right. Well, the marketing functions in transition now as well, so we'll have to. We're not the people to answer those questions, and we'll, we'll get back on that. Alan, and then Jim. Oh, two questions. I'm curious about the assumption that 60 percent is the lowest assumption. It doesn't have to be. I don't. I don't. I can't speak to that. This was this was done by a, a person who had more marketing ex knowledge than I do, so I don't know what the magic is in 60. Okay. In your list, thank you. In your list of things that you, when you were responding to Greg about things that your committee is looking at, missing to my ears was the question of, of the impact of our new membership structure. So refresh my aging memory. 
do we have a built-in staff and board board review of this impact of this new membership structure and so on? We're not scheduled it yet. Was um, it built in? Was it built into our decision? I'm asking you yeah. to. That so, we would do something. But I do want to say so every quarter in the financial report, we show a comparison of what our assumptions were for what we what we assumed people's behavior, you know, what they would do, what they would choose, compared to what they actually did. So we're at, we're reporting that quarterly um, and using that in our analysis there. Okay. Thank you. Ginny? Yeah, I was just wondering uh, about Haven on the Lake. <clears throat> if um, the chart where you have. Uh, expenses per square foot or expenses as a percent of revenue. Uh, I see the ice rink and Supreme Sports Club and others, Columbia Gym, but I don't see Haven on the lake. So, unless it's so the depreciation in metric seven, Ginny? Yeah, we're right. Talking about? Yeah, we can put that in there. These are depreciation and repairs and maintenance. We just put the main um, clubs on here and, and the main buildings and the older ones. So this is... Um, what is all S and F? All sport and fitness. The average of so all whatever's the, the total, oh, not oh, the average. Okay. Is, yeah, I get it. Okay, yeah, I was just. No, I'm sorry. It is the average. Is that Lynn? What's the all F's and F? All sport and fitness. Is that the remaining facilities? Is that where Haven on the Lake could be located, or? It's included in that. Sorry. Yeah. Is it such a big issue? Should that be separated out? <clears throat> Depreciation and repairs and maintenance are a big well, issue. Anything? Any information on? Um, um, we could add that in. It just percent yeah. of expenses, a percent of revenue chart. The um... uh, yeah, so you would like to see metric seven? Those two charts include Haven on the Lake um, s separately. Oh, I would think so. Yeah. How would you do depreciation since we don't own the building? We have depreciation on our ass on the on the investment that the capital investment that CA has made. Okay. Okay, you know the equipment and build out. And... Nancy. Um, moving forward, now that we're going to have sales, um, a sales team, or we have a sales team, so will we get a comparison of cost of new memberships um, based on the cost of the new sales team? This is advertising effectiveness, so no, I don't think that would be relevant. Do you? I mean, I don't. Well, we want to see if they're actually fulfilling their mission. No? Well, we're s tracking that by the by looking every, uh, you know, how uh, every day at new sales. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I'd let you. It's it's about generating new sales. Right. Mm -hmm. um, as we've said before in the meetings, the, the change in decline in memberships is from the lack of new sales, not from the ocean attrition. Mm -hmm. the, the number of members leaving is actually mm -hmm. fairly low overall. Um, and it's been a decline in new new sales. Um, so the, the metric that we're measuring the sales team against is increasing those those new sales and the new members coming in, as well as the quality of the membership coming in. Um, are we able to sell fit and play to them? Um, which engages typically, if you're selling a fit and play, families tend to buy fit and plays. Um, single people buy single club memberships. Families will buy play or uh, fit and play memberships. Mm. So selling fit and play memberships typically means you're engaging more families. I don't entirely agree with that okay. because I think a single club membership limit is very limiting. I mean, even for my usage, for example, <coughs> I use a couple of different facilities, and so it would be too limiting for me to just use the play. And I know for a fact from other people that I see at the facilities that they too use a number of facilities and so have to buy the fit and play for individuals. And that's something I think we should look at. Jenny. Yeah, just uh, piggyback what Nancy's saying there. Um, I think the last meeting I had asked you if we had goals for uh, the new staff that we were hiring uh, and then. I'd love to hear what they are and your evaluation after three months of how close they're coming to meeting those sales goals. Because mm -hmm. we are paying X amount of dollars more uh, to achieve a certain goal. I have no understanding of what that goal is. Okay. Uh, I, and I assume you do. Right? Yeah. I do? Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> so if you just share with us. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move on. Um, board action consent agenda or approve the minutes and the appointments to say architectural committee. Okay. I want to, um, first of all, I want to welcome uh, County, County Council Member Jen Parasa. Thank you very much for attending tonight. Board votes. Okay, the recommendation is to um, add uh, Liang China as uh, Columbia's fifth sister city. Okay, all in the discussion. Any discussion? Okay, if not, I'll take the vote. All those in favor of the recommendation to add? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Hmm? Greg, Greg was up. Oh, Greg was up. Well, but, but it was unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> All the people <laughs> were here. Oh, Greg, how he voted. Right. <laughs> okay. Ferrari Hills, Beverage Cart. The recommendation is, is to um, allow the Beverage Cart to sell alcohol. Any discussion? I have some questions. Yes, tell. So if I'm reading this document from Ginger Scott, are we following the law? Because the law said to ensure that granting the license does not disturb the peace. That was superseded by an order the next that was a different later. So that means this is the old one, right? It's That's not, it's not yeah. applying to our... doesn't okay. apply to the new, new liquor license. Okay, good. All right, any other discussion? No. <laughs> okay. All right. The recommendation is to, as I said, to uh, allow the beverage cart to sell alcohol. Um, all those in favor? Uh, looks unanimous. Mine is Greg. All right. We want to Patuxent Trail. I'm going to ask Milton. It, what I'd like to do is and that. Let me just say I want to thank Val for um, head of planning and zoning for um, sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for coming. Could we uh, possibly deal with the gun resolution? No, well, we're going to. We got it. We got it. Milton? Okay. Basically, we, we were asked to have a a time on the board meeting for a discussion about the Patuxent Trail and the uh, construction of the storage facility. Basically, what we want to do, there's about five slides that CA wants, we want to show our involvement, just give you some idea how we got involved, the vicinity of the location. And then when I, in a conversation with Val, he, he informed me some of the steps that the county is taking. They're looking at a different approach. And, and Val, if I'm saying something incorrectly, Please correct me. They're, the county is now looking at a, a, a short-term strategy and a long-term strategy, with a long-term strategy including the county executive, uh, including dollars in its capital budget proposal to deal with it on a longer-term strategy. And so I asked Val if he could be here this evening and other county staff to just give us an idea of what, what, what they've developed so far, understanding that that's still those, that long-term strategy especially is still being developed. Hmm. Okay, Dennis. So I'll start with the where to the southeast corner um, on the periphery of Columbia. And it's an, it's an outpost, it's not in the end of George. And um, moving in a little bit, um, you'll see it better off of Wilford Road. Um, and one more time, this shows uh, land ownership in that immediate vicinity. And the county association is a big land owner in that area. But of course, we don't own these properties to build a board park, it's going to end on. And what is the purple just to the left of the turn? That's around? the um, Columbia Mall Inc. owns that piece of property. Of somebody, course. <laughs> I, I started, somebody looked at it and said, I don't see the Columbia Mall. But the Columbia Mall Inc. owns that piece of property. It's a legacy piece of property. We've been trying to figure out how to get that piece of property turned over to us. But right now it's the Columbia Mall Inc. Is that the same as basically GGP or is that? Yes. Some people, okay. So we were approached on uh, May of uh, 2017 by the developer engineer, and he had some specific uh, easements for utilities that he came to us and asked him about. We told him that there were generally three conditions. One, that the property would have to be put under the annual charge. Two, that there would be a rapid approval process. And thirdly, that the CA board would have to approve 
student and the easement that were granted. Subsequently, there were some conversations, some discussion by staff with, with regard to whether or not an entrance off Delta Road made sense. And in fact, there are some technical obstacles that, that uh, still are in play that were reasons that were cited by the engineer why they didn't think that was promising. Um, but that we, there was no further follow up from the developer or his engineer. And subsequently, they moved on with the town attorney process. And so, on the CA piece of it, are there any questions? Ciao. So, one question When do you think their easement request will come to CA board? Um, well, if they, had, if they had asked for an easement, it would come to the CA board a couple of months ago. And there would have been a RAC approval process, mm -hmm. um, zoning matter, and there would have been architectural approval and site plan approval. And we would look part of that is probably not, um, we probably may have asked for some changes. But in fact, that wasn't required for them to develop their property. They worked around their utility easement request, so they did not need to come back to us. Yeah. Dick is next, and then Nancy, and then. Just, just how are they getting their utilities in? Are they going down the old Guilford Road? And, and well, they're, they're kind of going the long way, um, but they're taking, well, they're taking a long way for both utility easements um, um, to work around the requirement to come under the annual charge, to go through the RAC approval process, and to receive a board approval. And, and they didn't want to deal with us because of, you know, the, the concessions we were looking for? I can I imagine that's the case. The CA lane would probably do it. Nancy. Uh, um, this is kind of opening up a bag of worms, and here I am. Um, I have a, a serious concern that we were not informed of this um, when the issue first came up because, as you have heard from people in the audience, um, and I've, I have heard from people, this is a huge poke in the eye, and um, this is a budding CA property, and although we don't have a right to yay or nay, I really feel that we've been slipping up a few times too many um, by not in being informed, by the board not being informed of issues such as this. Um, I just spoke or I actually heard from and spoke to Calvin Ball and asked him, for example, about the Royal Farms and was told essentially it's done. So it's done. Well, this is what he essentially said to me. The Royal Farms? Well, let's well, well, I'm just, <laughs> let, let, let's part of my, well, this is all part of my it. issue is that we need to be better informed about things that come to you, come to the staff, should then be almost immediately brought to the board so Nancy. we are informed so we can respond. Nancy, there's nothing to respond to. They, they approached us. <clears throat> we outlined to them what the steps needed to be taken. Mm -hmm. We even, and they said, they told us that that would be an obstacle looking at Guilford Road. Mm -hmm. We reached out to them finding, uh, to ask if they're going to come back to us. Mm -hmm. They didn't come back to us. Okay. So there's nothing for us to inform you of. But I understand that in the meantime, it has gone to the county, tell me if I'm wrong, and that this is essentially a done deal with the developer. Is that right? Or can we stop the developer from doing this? Well, it's not so much as, as, as it went to the county through, their, uh, through the county's process right. last, late last fall, and right. the county process, they approved it. That's what I'm saying. Right. And so the, the residents in the community of, of Huntington and King's Contrivance have had no opportunity to... It was not a part of the process that's in place there. Well, I understand that, but I think that's a problem. You're telling me it's not part of the process, and I'm saying as a board member who hears from very unhappy residents because they feel that this is a very precious area that people have enjoyed for years and now suddenly it's being changed in such a way to make it downright dangerous for but them. But also, are we losing the fact that that's private property also? You can't forget the fact that's private property. I, I, I understand it's private property, but shouldn't, since Columbia owns everything around it, I understand this is like a donut in the middle? Yes. Okay, and so wouldn't we have some say, I would hope, I know the county doesn't want us to have any say, but shouldn't we make some kind of a, an approach to the county so that we would be able to have some say as to what happens to 
land that abuts ours in such a way that is so different from other things. If it were a residence, it would be fine. There was a residence there before. But if it's something so different that is going to change the traffic pattern, it's going to make an impact on that trail, we need to have a say. This is well. What say is it? It was a zoning matter that went before the county. Right. Zoning matters or do not belong before CA. I, I think part of the thing that people seem to be missing is that this property is non-new town. Okay, so that means it is handled through the normal Euclidean process. The normal Euclidean process. If an owner of a property comes and says, I want to build what the property allows me to zone, it just kind of goes in. There's no public notification. There's nothing because it doesn't, that's a totally different process. You got to make sure that it is not Newtown. Newtown has things built in. Board members have, have, have had their hands up. Alan's next and then Sherry. I don't think anybody has lost sight of the fact that it's private property and that it's M1 zoning and the county has its own process. What I'm strongly agreeing with Nancy about is that there's more to it than that. There's impact on Columbia. There's impact on residents. There's impact on the neighborhood. And I agree with those who looked up at that and said, if we're going to live into our mission and create the vision that we want to have, we need to be on the lookout for those kinds of things. So that was, I think, both the neighborhood center issue and this are examples of where we're not paying strong enough attention to those issues. So let me ask Dennis, from your okay. point of view, I've heard Nancy assert that we don't have any say, but I've also assert that we have land all the way around, and if it is a donut, I assume that we might have some. Is there anything that we could, could do? It's the same question I asked a resident. Is there anything we could do to put the brakes on this or to... Uh... Yeah. So there's, so there's uh, that property abuts the street. Okay. Jen, right. Jen is nodding her head. I don't know whether she's agreeing with you or saying yes, there is. I don't know what so CA can do. Lots of the public road. If you're accessing it off the public road, you're not asking for your utility easement from us. We're not required. Are they asking to do, to do a driveway across our land? No. 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 Sure. And Greg. Uh, okay. Dick and Greg. You know, I want to talk to, to this in terms of the lived experience and make clear that the assumption was by community members that CA was responsible. And this was very, very hard for me to get across to anyone in the community. Um, people are not versed in M1 with its 67 different possibilities. Um, what they know is they see open space mm -hmm. and they identify CA with open space. And people feel that we are the stewards of the land. To say that this was a small piece of residential property, all those things may be true legally, but that is not the felt feeling of the people in this community and the people who are using that trail all the time. For years and years and years, people have been using it. It says Patuxet Branch Trail Head. There was nothing else going on there. The gentleman who lived in that building very rarely came out. There were no cars there. And there's no entrance and no exit anywhere else. It was simply for the trail. So this is a perceptual issue. And this has, this has really, um, in many ways, a cast CA in the role of, of having to, to look at, you know, who owns what land? It was very, very confusing and still is to find out because the community believes that when HRD was part of CA, one part of CA and the Rouse Corporation talked to the other part. We now don't have that anymore. And what this board needs to do is come to this new reality. This is a different reality. People who have lived in the community for 20 years still think that that's the case. And therefore, we must have done something. So while I understand what you're saying about uh, we don't have the authority, but we have been tasked with the responsibility. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that we do play a role of advocacy so that if this trail is going to go under, if it's going to pose a safety hazard, this is no different than residents coming to us and saying cars are speeding along my road. You know, as village board members, as members of CA, we don't turn them away and say, well, the road is the county's business, so we're not going to touch this. Good luck. Good luck talking to somebody at the county. We advocate for our communities and we try to find solutions. So I think that's the important thing that we're looking at tonight, is we're looking at what other possibilities could exist. This is not blaming. This is not offering rationales. It is what it is, but this is not safe for the people who are on that trail. So one of the things at, at these various meetings, community members have been trying to come up with different ideas. One possibility, and I've looked at these maps, if we can't change the entrance to the developer's area, can we change the entrance to the trailhead? Can we change? to get people away from those cars and U-Hauls that are going to be turning in there. A different trailhead with a short road off of Guilford would accomplish very much the same kind of thing. This is a separation of people who are out there recreating on bikes and joggers and people with dogs and people with, you know, toddlers on tricycles keep them away from where those trucks are going. That's, that's the problem. And so let's really define, you know, we don't need a solution until we really decide what the problem is. I think the problem is safety. Mm -hmm. I think the main problem is safety. The other problem that people have brought up to me repeatedly, and there are two, you know, over 2,000 people signed these petitions. Nobody has seen uh, the environmental impact. Very few people have seen the site design because none of that was public. So there's no information out there. I think it is to the benefit of the developer and to the benefit of the county, quite frankly, to get some real information out there. Let's start to make some of this public so people can see what the engineering report is, see what's realistic, and if the county could move that trail that could be a real boon to the people who use that trail. Could I raise a point of information? I'm new to this. Alan, Alan, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand this. I don't, I don't, it looks like the trail goes to the south of the property. I'm not understanding what the issue is. Because the cars are going to go there. The entrance to the, the, the <clears throat> site plan. Excuse me, would it be possible that somebody simply use one of these maps and point to what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, it's really not helpful. Could we could we move on and let Val outline yeah, his yeah. his he might have short term maps. and long term? Okay, I think it's very hard for people to envision because there is no map in front of them. I think it's very hard, and that's what Jenny is alluding to. So, Dennis, could you just point to where the entrance to the storage facility would be? Oh, it's way down the road. Guilford Road. Okay. Well, it's not old. Old Guilford Road. Old Guilford Road. This is Old Guilford Road. Old Guilford Road. Thank you. That is the trail. Right through here. Thank you. That is Somebody said that was off the Guilford Road. Can we let Val kind of let? Let's try and let Val because he might answer some of the questions. Val, do you want to try to? No. We were up. Uh, good evening. I'm Val Lasnitz. I'm the uh, planning director um, for Howard County. Page up. I don't want to go back. Okay. Just a little bit of history on the property. So in 1961, uh, this property was owned residential. It allowed basically half acre lots. In 1977, it was what I'll call up zoned from half acre lots to uh, R12, which permitted 12,000 square foot lots and duplexes. In 1985, that's when somebody um, should have raised this as a question. That's when this property was rezoned 
to allow for M1 uses. And M1 uses allow storage facilities. They allow warehousing. They allow various types of commercial activities. So there's a whole plethora of uses that are permitted in M1. This is not NT, this is not Columbia zoned property here. And so in 1992, um, maybe I'm breathing on it. Um, 1992, um, my former office was across the street in that triangular building right there. That's when the Rivers Corporate uh, Park got um, its development pattern going in earnest on the kind of the south side of Guilford Road. At no point has the county vacated Old Guilford Road. Um, our Office of Law checked, because that was one of the questions that came up in the community meeting that we recently had at Hammond High School, which I think was a really successful meeting. Uh, we heard a lot of good ideas, and you'll see some of those reflected. Um, but um, at no point has the county vacated Old Guilford Road. It was transferred from the state of Maryland to Howard County, so it is a a county road. It served that single residence for all of those years. And the land around this property is zoned NT open space. So the only access that this property has, its only legal access, um, is from Old Guilford Road. So the process for developing this property, it's staff level site plan review. It doesn't go to the planning board because it's zoned M1. Um, we don't require M1 zoned projects to go to the planning board. Mm -hmm. All the information in terms of what's being proposed, <coughs> all the reports, everything is available mm -hmm. on our website. Uh, anyone who's interested in development plans can go to the county uh, DPZ's website and research uh, you know, all of that information. There's no pre-submission community meeting like there are for um, many other projects because this property is more than 200 feet from residential land. Again, as I mentioned, Old Guilford Road's a public street. It, it singly provides access to the, to the property. And just to clarify, the entire street um, is not the trail and it has never been the trail. Perhaps folks got used to using the entire street as a trail, but it, it is a public street. So why does it have barriers on it? It has barriers on the track yeah. on the road. It's designated as a trail. Right so now, as of today, and we have pictures of that. So can you describe why that is now a road? Um, Mr. Stack, I don't know how you operate here, but you know, you, you Just want me to continue answer with or? your presentation. Okay, now. thank you. Um, so um, the driveway access to Guilford Road, not. Old Guilford Road, but to Guilford Road was suggested uh, by the Department of Planning and Zoning staff by the Office of Transportation. Um, and our understanding is that, as, as Mr. Matthews mentioned, that the developer met with CA, discussed um, what are the parameters of securing access through NT uh, open space property to connect directly to Guilford Road. They chose not to do that. Um, the county cannot require any other access if a property fronts on a public street. I mean, there are a number of court cases that have dealt with this particular issue and uh, of, of uh, local jurisdiction, um, what I'll call abusing its authority by requiring a private property owner some circuitous access, you know, or, or you know, forcing them to deal with another entity. It would be the equivalent of saying, we're going to put a jersey barrier in front of your driveway. We're not going to allow you access onto your, onto your street. Go work out the details with your neighbor. It's not something that the county can do. If we did, I'm, I'm certain it would be taken to court, and we'd be the, on the losing end of that type of a lawsuit. So, so what the developer has done at this point is what they are legally permitted to do. We attempted to uh, uh, encourage them to gain access to, to Guilford Road, but we can't force them to do that. There was a, there's been another proposal for side access um, to, uh, so my understanding is that this, 
the side access, there was a proposal by a citizen to, if this is Guilford Road, uh, this is what I'll call the throat right here, mm -hmm. and this is all old Guilford Road here. They were proposing a curb cut that would basically put in a parallel driveway that would go along uh, this side of the building to connect into uh, the proposed storage facilities parking lot. So you'd end up with a parallel street, in effect, next to Old Guilford Road as a way of getting traffic um, off of Old Guilford Road and onto an internal drive right here. The problem with that, we ran that by the Department of Public Works and um, the Office of Transportation and our um, design engineering division. It doesn't meet spacing requirements. That distance of the throat between Old uh, Guilford Road intersection and the Old Guilford Road intersection is too tight to accommodate um, yet another driveway. It, it would just create too many turning conflicts in a short distance. So if trucks or you know, any other vehicle, larger vehicle, were coming off of Guilford Road, mm -hmm the maneuver to make that right and then yet another immediate right would be slower due to the early second right turn. Uh, that could you know, create traffic issues for anyone coming in behind there. Uh, the right turn in off of Old Guilford Road would require a larger swing by a truck and in effect the truck would have to pull into the opposing lane in order to be able to make a sharp turn um, into that driveway. Um, you know, what we heard uh, is that a lot of trail users park along that stretch of roadway. It could block the entrance. Um, and, you know, trucks coming in and out at the same time could cause vehicles to stop on Guilford Road, trying to maneuver to get in. And the entrance is proposed where we heard at the meeting that a lot of trail users say they walk in off of Guilford Road and use the throat as a way to get over to the, um, to the, uh, uh, to the parking area for the trail for the trailhead and so you know from a safety standpoint what you want to do is you want to get the vehicle entrance away from that and it should be on the straight section of the roadway to protect pedestrians and and finally um, comments from the department of public works they require full access to the existing public road for utilities drainage and utility easements so um, consequently what the county executive has proposed is uh, an addition to the capital budget. Um, and what would occur here, um, hopefully in, uh, in this next fiscal year, would be the construction of a 10-foot wide multimodal trail. This would be consistent with the, the width of the existing trail. At the minimum, the pinch point would be a five-foot buffer. So that, that green separation, that lawn area you see between the people walking and the street, that would be at the tightest point, five feet. Um, and safety features would be added in there, um, large boulders and, and street trees to, again, one, soften the view, because that was the one thing that we heard at the public meeting. Um, the current solution of having those flex posts in there, um, folks just didn't feel that that fit with the character of, uh, of the area. And so this would allow a green strip in there and our hope actually would be to um, work with CA that the trail could meander away from the roadway and the pinch point would be five feet, but hopefully there would be a much greater separation from the trail and the, the, the roadway itself. You know, it could be 10, could be 15 feet. The details of that really need to be worked out. So. What this drawing shows is the absolute minimum, which is, a, which is a five foot green strip. And this is consistent with any trail that is currently um, constructed by the county. I think it's consistent with a lot of the trails uh, throughout Columbia as well. And we think that this is a, you know, based on what we heard at that public meeting, we think that this is a, a good approach to take because at this point, you know, one, we have, we, we've, encourage the developer to um, look at other access. They've chosen not to for a variety of reasons. It's far uh, along in the, in the development process at this point. And so we think that this is a reasonable approach to, uh, to take. And we think it, it results in a safe configuration of a trailway 
that accommodates both pedestrians and bicyclists. So, thank you, Val. Okay, Dick and Greg, and the red hat, and then Alan and Chow. Chow was Dick. first. Well, was Chow first? Chow. Okay, uh, Val, thank you very much, and and I do like your proposal here. Um, but there's some other things uh, I'd like, just like to bring up. Uh, first of all, uh, if I want to change my uh, my deck, I've got to get the permission of the people who live on both sides of me. And in a situation uh, like this, where we have a uh, a piece of property that's surrounded on four sides, basically by uh, new town zoning, it sure would be helpful if. Uh, we got a heads up when things like this came along. Um, and uh, I'm also thinking, Milton, maybe we should have Jane keeping an eye on the uh, monitoring uh, uh, proposals uh, that, that appear, uh, county proposals that uh, affect our property or contingent or adjacent to our property. Um, I, I'm particularly concerned about this road uh, because it's not only going to have traffic on it but people who've never driven a truck before are going to be running trucks to haul their stuff in and uh, so it's going to be doubly dangerous so uh, we definitely need to get some kind of a real separation between any traffic going back here and uh, the uh, the pathway um, but uh, I'd just like to ask you, knowing what uh, an explosion of rage you've gotten from this, is there anything that you would have done differently uh, had you uh, known what kind of a hornet's nest you're running into? Or are there any things that perhaps the county ought to consider in the future uh, to avoid uh, problems like this? Well, you know, um, it, it, uh, it it's always good to kind of look at things uh, if you can if you can anticipate what kinds of issues might crop up. At, at this point, the development review process worked the way that our current development review process is supposed to work. However, we're in the midst of, uh, we're just gonna be kicking off now the rewrite um, of our development regulations. And, and I'm, you know, uh, there was a presentation to you about the, the findings that came out of that. And, and I think that's one of the things that I mentioned at that, uh, uh, at the meeting at Hammond High School was that, you know, we're kicking off that process. And if we want to take another look at how notice occurs, um, you know, we post properties um, for, you, you know, public hearings, the development process. Um, we, could, we could look at, you know, how, how something gets posted, you know, in these, uh, in, in these outlot conditions in Columbia. That's, that's something that we can look at. But, you know, again, from the standpoint of, you know, <coughs> not, not wanting to be a 100% rule stickler, the, the, the rules were, were followed in this case. Um, it's just that um, maybe our, our rules need tuning or our process needs tuning up. So, Well, thank you. And I, I hope then when we are looking at the new zoning, zoning regulations, we keep things like this in mind. Mm -hmm. Great. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, one thing I want to take up with staff, uh, CA staff at some point, is whether we knew, I didn't realize the date, it was 2017. If we knew back in 2017 that that entrance was going to be on this thing called Old Guilford Road, um, this board should have known about it. This is probably, of all the trails I'm on, I'm on, I'm on the trails quite a bit, this is probably the most used trail, the most popular trail. It's like one of these spinal trails, okay, in Columbia. This is not one of ours. Well, it connects two courts with a tot lot in the middle. Okay, I don't get how we don't know how we didn't know about this, and I'm, I'm quite upset about it. Um, I don't call this a trailhead, with all due respect, Sherry. This is not a trailhead. This is a, this is a continuous trail. Um, this isn't the start. This is again. This is a spine. Um, the county, sir, with all due respect, should have foreseen all of this. Mm -hmm. All of this, if it knew um, that the uh, plan was to put to turn this back into a road. I don't agree or buy this idea that it was always a road. No, whether the barricades were there or not, what the, what this developer is proposing is it, and the county is allowing is that this is going to be turned back into a road. This hasn't been a road in years. Okay, 
uh, for all, and, and, and that's just the de facto lay of the lay of the land, whatever. It just has not been a road. It's going to be turned back into a road. And I can't believe that this was sprung on us this late in the process. I do think that um, the county could have done something and should have done something about this with the developer early on. Now it's too late, right? Now it's too late. Now, now it's on taxpayers, right? You know, thanks. Thanks. Well, you know, hold on, sir. Because, because sure. now we're going to have to pay. The county's actually going to put something in the budget. We're now going to have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars or something for a trail that the developer is going to get for free. Mm -hmm. um, I don't appreciate that. And it really bothers me now that, that, that this is all being put on us and nothing was no, with no advance notice. Um, I, I'm happy there. I mean, I can live with that solution. It's fine because that's probably the only thing we're going to get. Mr. Sack, if I could respond to that. Sure, Ralph. You know, um, we have to look at things from multiple perspectives. Um, there, there was obviously a perspective by the trail users, uh, but then, you know, in terms of cost, um, had we said, Mr. Developer, we are going to force you to negotiate with CA, which it, we encouraged them, but if we were to say, we're gonna make you, we're gonna make you negotiate with CA, we would be in court and then the public would be picking up court costs. So that's what you have to say now. I'm sorry. That's what you have to say now. A, a year ago, we we, we the, did. The time we for encouraged solution is them. Now it's passed. You know, it's passed, and that bothers me. It, now you've been out there. The developers put all this time and money, done all this work. There's no way you can put it on the developer. I absolutely agree. The, but we the developer chose not to go in that direction. We encouraged them to talk to CA. They talked to CA, CA basically laid out, here's what you need to do. At that point, there is no leverage. We can't, we can't force somebody to use somebody else's property for access. So, so that's where, that's where the situation is. It's unfortunate. I wish it would, would be different, but that's the situation. Ciao. Uh, well, thanks for coming. What's the cost for that road? I'm sorry? What's the estimated cost for that, that multi-mode? Um, Trail. Yeah, we uh, the the estimate right now for the capital projects is about two hundred thousand okay. dollars. Thank you, mm -hmm. Alan. A couple of things. Um, apropos of what Greg's saying, every time I've ever talked to a developer about standing up to the county for something, they always say, "Oh no, we can't get the county angry because we need their approval." That's usually what I hear. I don't hear, "Eh, we're." We, we have it in the bag, so it, that doesn't quite fit. Uh, is the existing trail a county trail or a CA trail? It's on, um, that part of it would be on county property, so the, so the rest of the trail, most of the rest of the trail is on open space, but that bit that can be used as a trail is still on county property. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it, it would be a county trail, um, and hopefully um, CA would agree to uh, an easement that would allow the trail uh, maximum separation from the roadway. So again, you know, what we're suggesting here is a minimum five foot uh, buffer area, but if we can pull it away as far as possible to maximize the separation, that, that would be, I think, uh, the county's objectives. And I've talked to Mr. Matthews, and, and, and I, you know, at this point, um, you know, he's indicated uh, support for that idea. What would happen if CA decided, if the board said, no, we're not going to give to do that? Well, well then it would really be unfortunate. Um, and uh, we would most likely be left with a couple of different options. Um, one, uh, depending on the location of utility poles, um, the best case scenario would just be a five foot grass strip. Uh, the worst case scenario might be um, a situation where to avoid a utility pole, we're back to a combination of a five foot green strip and, uh, and flex posts if, if there's not enough dimension. Could you go back to the previous slide, please? If, if the county decommissioned Old Guilford Road mm -hmm. and said it's no longer a road, mm -hmm. Would that impact the safety concerns about the turn because there'd no longer be a road, Old Guilford Road? Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll go back to my comments about a court case. 
That's not a good court Take case. Property rights away. I don't couldn't. Can't do I that. mean, this developer is is under construction to yes. to come in and, and say, well, now we're going to vacate a road and and now landlock your property. Um, that would uh, uh, I I would dare say that we'd be talking to uh, the developer's attorney probably the next day. Well, I was thinking to make it. Would it make the side entrance be past the safety test? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, the, the developers indicated, look, um, they are at this point, they've explored coming off of Guilford Road. They've, they've reviewed the, the side access um, situation as well. They're, they're proceeding. Their commitment to us is really about assisting with the trail, um, assisting with boulders and street trees, which, which frankly, they they don't need to do this is this is something that they um, at least at this point verbally have indicated that they are willing to do. Thank you. One minute. If you go back up one, it looks from this map like our property does go all the way around this entire no. property. Yeah, it, it's it's That's not. Nice. There's an intervening um, right of way um, that abuts the M1 property. That that if if that's the way that it looks, it's it's not, okay. it, it doesn't paint the complete picture. At some point tonight, I'd love to hear from Council Member Taras on this because it seems like she has some ideas. But well, go Sherry first. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, Val, I I wish in looking at the whole sequence, um, I really wish that somebody had come to our village board because we could have given you a lot of information right from the very beginning. And it would have been a very cooperative process. Um, so I'm just going to echo a little bit of what Dick said. Um, the other thing I want to say is if you look on the, uh, what you've just said, the, the developer at one point in a, an email that he sent out um, said that he was, um, that he had always intended to put in uh, an expansion of that road. So I'm surprised to hear the county say that the county is going to pay the cost of the 200000 I'm sorry. Um, the, maybe, maybe you could clarify. I'm not quite sure I understood what you meant, that the developer the was... The yes, the widening of the road. The developer that, is paying the cost of that. Okay, the developer is, yes. is paying all of that. Okay, so so... Um, so the only there's only a small piece of the land there that is CA, and all the rest of it is what the developer has bought from where the house was. I've been there many, many times. I have looked at that roadway. I have looked at the um, there. There are stones there from from the original Guilford uh, uh, quarry. Um, so it goes right up to the road. Is, is that correct? Which road are you referring to? And, at Old Guilford, as because the site development plan has the entrance going in way down the road. Right. How come that was decided on? Um, be, and and what this drawing doesn't show is the floodplain. Um, the floodplain is at its widest um, to the right on the right side of this image. But you think it's right? Right. Yeah. And, and so the narrowest point of the floodplain is where the entrance is proposed, and that's what really drove the location of where the entrance would be. Okay, so is the CA property also floodplain? Yes. Okay, so that would that. So we're talking about impact to floodplain, mm -hmm. whether the developer puts in the road on the diagonal. Or whether CA gives permission for anything over there, we're still impacting the floodplain. Correct. Uh, the you mean? Are we talking about? I'm just trying to get it straight. Are we talking about the trail concept? I'm talking about coming in. There, there are two different colors: green here, at least on our screens. Yes, coming, yes, from coming in from, from the here, side. So you would have an impact on the floodplain. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but if... And, and you would be adding additional impervious, you'd be doubling, potentially doubling the amount of impervious.
impervious surface right there because you'd be duplicating, I'm not saying you personally, but generally speaking, the, the amount of impervious surfaces would be doubled because now you'd end up with a parallel road to Old Guilford Road and, and you know, that is not accounted for in the design of the stormwater management system. So that would also have to be addressed. So that would have to be redone. The developer would have to redo a that. Everything, yeah, that would trigger a com most likely a complete redo of, of the plan. And I can just tell you that the developer has indicated that they are not at this point interested in making um, any changes to the site plan. They're under construction. Yeah. And, but what they're willing to do is they're willing to contribute um, to soften um, the look of the buffer area uh, that would parallel <clears throat> Old Guilford Road. Okay, so I just have one other comment here. Another proposal that was made, actually there are two other proposals that were made that apparently never got much attention, but I think they're, they're both worthwhile looking at. And one is to move the <coughs> trailhead. <laughs> The entrance for those who are interested in using the trail away from Old Guilford Road, the, the entry of Old Guilford Road, um, and let the, the developer use that. And if the county is not going to pay that 200000 and the developer is going to be paying it, why not be able to make that separate cut? The road is flat. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, grade there. I was just out there the other day taking a look at it because that was the old 32 road. There's a small strip that would just go right from a new entrance to that gravel road, and trail users would be able to use that. Then if you have cross-hatching and you have this other suggested parallel with the, the buffer, that makes it so much safer for people coming in. It keeps the parking area separate. It keeps the turning separate. So could the county do that? Well, I, I can't speak for the Department of uh, Recreation and Parks, but that's something that I can bring back to them and, and indicate that you know, that was an idea that was raised. So. And from the map that I've seen, and Dennis, if you could <clears throat> maybe just point out where that would be, it is county. It is county right of way. You know, if, if I may, Val, I think a point for clarification is needed. I think, Shari, you said that the county, the developer's paying for the $200,000. No, that's in the county's capital budget. The, 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 the 10 foot wide pathway that the county is talking about, that's in the county's capital budget. The developer is not paying. Yeah, the, develop, the developer is paying to, to widen the road because I, I think the dimensions of the road off the top of my head right now are, I think, 20, 20 feet or something like that. They are widening Old Guilford Road towards their side. Yes. All right, so that you know that that's what I understood. So, okay. so that's that's the part that that is going to be put in there. So why is I'm hearing two different things here. I'm hearing that the developer is doing it, and I'm hearing that no, the county's doing, doing it. No, the road, the actually the old Guilford Road. Mm -hmm. The developer is planning to widen that, but the right. ten foot wide pathway is what the county is doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next so the buffer part, right? Well, the not, pathway not the buffer and, and the buffer, right? The taxpayers will pay. Okay. Um, what I, all I know, yeah, and I think that's a very good point, that, that the trail is something, I've been here for 30 years, and most of the people that I've talked to who are out there daily, they're also people who've been here 25, 30 years. They've paid for this pathway system, which is a glory along the river. This is a beautiful, scenic area that people use all the time and now we're going to be paying a lot more well, um, in order to be able to maintain what has been there for a very long time I you know again if this if this preserves safety and and this is what I have heard over and over again there's a safety issue and there's an environmental issue um, I haven't heard anything about the environmental impact, so I'm going to ask, is this something that has to be reevaluated? No. Oh, it, 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 in, w w I'm sorry. What has to be reevaluated? The environmental impact. Of what? Of the pathway? Of, of any of this proposal that no. you've come up with. 
I, I'm sorry. If, I'm just trying you're to get it straight. You're widening the pathway. You're putting in a buffer. How right. does that affect stormwater management? That, that's all going to be reviewed. That's all. So yeah, there is going to be another. Yeah, yeah, and is the developer going to do that? Ma'am, I, 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 what I clarified was the developer is just widening the road. It's the, it's the, it's the county that is going to be as part of a capital, hopefully as part of a capital project, installing the trail. The county will have to, um, depending on the way that that the road is constructed, it'll probably be a contract through the Department of uh, Recs and Parks. Somebody is going to have to be preparing engineering drawings. Those will all be uh, reviewed by the Department of Planning and Zoning. So yes, there will be an environmental review um, of the trail. But I just want to clarify one thing that I don't, mm -hmm. in my opinion, I don't think that the taxpayers are being um, charged for something that um, some might feel it is unnecessary. Um, there was a bike and and uh, a bike plan that was recently completed, and this section of path was never included in that bike in that bike trail uh, plan, and and perhaps that was an oversight because that roadway, um, you know, knowing that it could be used by that M1 parcel, however it developed, that that trail system could have never been shared with automobiles, trucks, as part of that roadway. So I think the missing element was maybe as part of the bike plan, we should have thought about this path system and talked to CA about it, and it could have been, could have been included. But that, I don't believe that there was ever a, a, a separate link, the, the kind of link that we're talking about this evening ever included as part of that. So I, I think it was just an oversight of not including it as part of the bike plan. And so now it's finally being included. Well, you know, I, I, there is really um, an issue. I, I was just out there and I was standing and talking with people and there were bikes coming this way and there were bikes coming this way and I literally had to jump out of the way. So I am hoping that with this widening that you're talking about, we're really going to have some kind of mixed use that's yeah. going to allow people mm -hmm. to be there safely to do the kind of recreating that they have been doing for it's the past be 15 just years. like all the other pathway systems just just like all the other ones 10 feet wide multi-use nancy you were did you have any no i think my answer my, got nope. my answers do you think i forgot what it was oh, andy I, I'm, I'm just going down my list okay I, I have you janet no. dick i'm gonna Greg. Okay, that, that last point, Val, I, I think confirms that people saw this as a trail that was was a trail, not a road that we needed to account for in the bike plan. You see what I mean? I mean it just it just it just confirms that that was the way everyone saw this. Yes. And and, I, I, and if you look at this oversight, but I, I, again, I I know you're you're going to resist this, but I really feel like a year ago, a year and a half ago. When the, when the developer came to the county with the as part of the permitting process, before it started scraping, that was the time where the county could have exerted something and tried to say, "Hey, we have a problem. Widening your road is not going to be sufficient. We need to talk about something that's going to preserve this major trail in our in our community." It's too late now. I agree with you. It's too, it, we can't do it now. I mean, but but uh, again, it's um, it, it's just it just boggles my mind that someone. And, and did, did not say, you know, time out. We need to figure out how we're going to make this trail work in conjunction with this proposed development. Well, I, th I, I think the process could have been smoother, but I think we ended up where, with the best solution because I, I really don't think that, you know, if we would have done this a year ago and tried to negotiate something and, and if we were successful, I think what we'd end up with is this solution which is a separation from the roadway. With we'll the never know. We'll never know. Well, I, that's the thing. Yeah, I... Lynn. Um, again, listening to this, I, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation. Um, however, I think the county should, the county has made, I think, a very reasonable response. You know, um, 
sounds like you heard there, there are other things that might have been tweaked here and there, but it's a very reasonable response in, re in response to citizens, citizen concerns. Frankly, I would love to know who the lawyer was in 1985 that got that zone dam one. Something tells me, I, I think I know who it was. <laughs> I think I do too. Yeah, but, we want to know his your address. Friend, your friend Dick Calkin probably did it. Yes, that's exactly. what I would have guessed. Yeah. Screw the community. Yeah, you know? I just yeah. have a fairly yeah. simple question. Um, th this, what's done is done, and it can't be undone, and I understand that. But moving forward, the county does have a lot of power and authority when such things come before them. And at that time, when something is adjacent, and I hope I'm speaking for the board, but I know I'm just speaking for me, that when something comes to the county, we really do need to find a solution so that rather than have an ugly scene like we're having, I consider this fairly ugly, uh, this evening, that we do have a system where the county comes to CA and the CA staff comes to the board with you here would be lovely. And we talk about it at the beginning of the stage so that we can actually have some input as this does impact our residents and our community. And I can't make that, that statement strongly enough. It is essential that we have better communication, better rapport, with us who are the so-called decision makers about what happens in Columbia, and I say so-called, and the county that apparently has the real power and authority. Because this developer, like other developers, they come to you, they ask you for X, Y, or Z, and you have the control <coughs> as to whether or not you say yay or nay. And I, I think that it really does behoove you to be a better neighbor to us. Well, ma'am, if I could yeah. just comment. Um, one, I think we do a pretty good job of communicating with CA staff. Um, you know, we worked very closely with Jane Demner on, on the Oakland Mills Village Center um, feasibility study. Uh, Jane um, participated when we went through the entire um, consultant selection process for phase one of the zoning code rewrite. Um, CA is going to be involved with, uh, with the next step of helping to develop the scope of services for that. So I think we've got a pretty good relationship and, and we work fairly closely with, uh, with CA staff. So, um, you know, there's always room for improvement and, uh, and, and I'd be happy to talk to, to Milton and, and, and Jane on, on, you know, ideas on how we can uh, do a better job. So. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to move on here. Uh, ne what are the next steps in terms of what is the role for CA in, in terms of any easements you might need, et cetera? What's the, what do you need? Um, or if you don't know now, when will you be, come back and tell us? And uh, what's the time frame? Uh, be so happy can, to. I think it's time to bring this to somewhat of an end. Okay. Um, so uh, right now, um, it was introduced um, as part of a capital project. It needs uh -huh. to be a approved by... Um, the County Council, uh, July 1 is when the new fiscal year starts. Um, it, we will need, to, um, at that point, there will be um, uh, a design prepared for it. At that point, we'll know exactly you know, how much um, room we need from CA to be able to accommodate the, the pathway to maximize the separation distances. And at that point, we'll, we'll be working with, with CA. Okay, so so the vote on the county council will be very dependent, or be written this way, will be dependent on CA's approval of giving the easement. Mm -hmm. Correct. I, mm -hmm. I don't I don't believe so. I think well, it it would just a, a smaller path. Yeah. We don't right, right. Okay, right. I got it. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. So David Lee with the uh, um, county. Could you go to the mic? Please? Sure. Mm -hmm. Could you open this together? Well, they with the county. Um, so just to clarify, there is funding in the current fiscal year. Um, so there was uh, some money for path, general pathway rehabilitation uh, that was left over in this current fiscal year that we are applying to this pathway. So if everything was approved, we could probably you know break ground fairly soon. Okay. Um, the money that 
it was to be applied for a certain project that will not happen this fiscal year will have to be you know uh, added on to fiscal year 19 and that part would have to be approved by the county council but in terms of paying for this path uh, the money is there now in this fiscal year all right milton i think just one that's point a different, that's a different thing than yeah just one point that I wanted to add to the equation. In my conversation with the county staff also, it was my understanding that when, the, when that, that older house, when it was first torn down and the land became available, the county tried to purchase it. And, and they got appraisal for it. And the developer ended up buying it for twice what the county's appraisal was for it. The county couldn't, we couldn't exceed the, right. the, the payment for uh, what it was being appraised for. Did we try to purchase it? No, we didn't try to purchase it. Nobody knew anything about it. We probably wouldn't have. You didn't know anything about it. Great. The house was knocked down before anybody knew anything. All right. <clears throat> just offer Jen, our council person, if she would just like to say a few words, and then we're going to end this issue. And thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Val. Thanks, David. So thank you for this opportunity. I am. Um, I'm just going to try to be respectful of the fact that I realize we've been talking about this for a long time. This is a very frustrating conversation for me, I must tell you, and I appreciate Greg's saying that, and Nancy, and obviously Sherry, we've been talking about this for a long time. This is very frustrating. And I think what frustrates me most tonight is sort of the idea that we can't do anything different next time. <laughs> and I think we can do something different next time. And one of the things I've already done, it's been introduced, I think it got introduced today, we were, it was, it's completed and should have been introduced today, is a bill that any time we have, any time a project ab abuts open space or um, a gov our government project, then they'll have to do the, the, the notice that they would have had to do here had this been next to residential. Because the problem is this is right near residential, but it's more than 200 feet away and that's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a horrible standard. So we don't need to wait to redo the whole zoning code to do that. Let's just get some of this done. Um, I want to make very clear, though, that the developer it was very, very interested in working with us. So this has nothing to do with the land being, uh, the county coming in and taking land. This has nothing to do with property rights. This has to do with having a proactive approach when, when the developer's project is going to impact our beautiful pathways and I think that's really the bottom line we could have been much more proactive and so here we are but let's talk about how we do that next time I mean I personally think there's still an opportunity to work with a developer I think we still haven't said to the developer what is needed to make this work for you I don't think anybody has said that to the developer I've talked to the developer actually now I think it's probably over a month ago sure it maybe no it was it was a while ago but it wasn't a long while ago this was like uh, two months ago, and they were very interested in continuing to work with us. They were concerned about the time delay. They had some other things, and I think those are things that if we take a proactive approach and say, look, we can move this along. They were worried about the CA process taking a long time, and if you guys knew what was at stake, you might, uh, you still have to follow your rules, but there might be, a, a, you might have brought this up sooner. So let's work together going forward. I still think we should be working together now I, I think um, I think Alan, it was you that said um, if you close that road, I, this is one of the I, I, maybe the folks behind me said this, and I haven't heard this before, but if you close that road to like then you could just use that as a like you don't need an extra entrance, you just close the road. It, it's a possibility, but anyway, that's I, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I am um, I do think it's a serious safety issue. I think it's um. It's very hard to hear somebody say that that is a road and not a path. And I understand the legal, legal distinction, but as long as I can remember, that was the place that I could bring my son, who's autistic, and I, there were very few places where I just felt that continuous, you're continuously on a safe path that's not by the road. And that's what we did. Like, we went there. We went with the dogs and the kids and the, like, this has been a pathway for as long as I can remember. And... I understand there's a technical distinction, but let's figure that out. Let's find out if there's others like this. Are there other places where, where this is going to happen? Let's find that out. Did mm -hmm. somebody had a question? Ginny. Yeah, um, council member, I would appreciate if you and David and Val got together and after hearing Val and then hearing David, I'm a little bit confused. 
Um, one, I'm hearing that it, you're looking at this in the capital budget, and if you approve it, it'll be July 1st, and then the money will be spent. But the other thing I'm hearing, I think, from David is that there's some money left over from another project in the budget that's already been approved last year, and you could really start this right away. Yeah, okay, so I can... that makes a big difference as to when CA maybe has to move a lot faster. From a timing perspective, I think... Um, Is the money there right now that could be used they've for told us that in the, in our bud They've told us that in our budget hearings. It's not leftover money. It was money that was going to be used for a different project, but, but, and they're reallocating it to this, so we have to put the 200000 back in for that project that it was scheduled. I can't, I want to say Haviland Mill Park or Haviland Mills. I, I can't remember where it was. Okay, so but it was already scheduled to be is used. the bottom line still then, this would be the budget you approve in May. It'll be effective July 1st, and you cannot use the money prior to that? Or is there no. something where you can be using money right now? They can be using the money now, is what they're so, telling us. So if that's true, what David's saying, and the money can be used now with whoever has to be involved in that, my point is, that CA then needs to perhaps be moving faster, and the board needs to be moving faster than waiting for that July 1st deadline. Oh, that's if where you we're going yes, to go with definitely. The plan that was shown up here. Definitely, okay, and I would say if you're going to do that, make difference. sure that there's an adequate barrier. Make sure that there's an adequate barrier there because um, what they're talking about is either putting boulders or trees there, and that's fine to keep the trucks from coming over but it doesn't keep the kids from running over. And that's why the pathway system was so important to me. Yeah. Oh, is it just, okay. it, and just, so this is, I think to Greg's point, this is the taxpayers paying for it, so let's just do it right next time. But I would still urge the parties to ask the developer what it would take for them to do it now. What is the cost to them of doing this? Is it a financial cost? They are indicated to me that it mostly, mostly was time, and we're, we're burning time now. Mm -hmm. And we're burning time this evening, so I will. I appreciate um, all your questions and your attention to this. Thank you, Jen. Appreciate okay. your coming. All right. Move on to National Gun Violence Awareness Day proclamation. Due to a power issue, several minutes of recording were lost. During this time, Jenny Thomas introduced a motion to suspend the rules and allow a vote that night on a National Gun Violence Awareness proclamation, which was seconded by Nancy McCord. That vote was anonymously in favor of the suspension and the proclamation. So Jenny made a motion, seconded by Dick, to... Dick made a motion, or somebody made a motion. Jenny moved, Jenny moved and Nancy seconded. Uh, Your motion, motion, their motion, everywhere. <laughs> motion got to, it's got to go in the minutes here. Uh, yeah. I All done. right. <clears throat> to basically... Um, Wave our process and allow a vote tonight on the motion. Is that good? Bauer, you got it? All right. Any discussion on that? Actually, questions. you're correct, Alan. It has to be re the requirement has to be waived by a two thirds vote. Two thirds vote. Actually, Sherry, I have a question for that. How often do we waive this requirement? Not very often. Very rarely. Very, very rare. Do we ever like waive this requirement before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. Yeah. yeah. It's got to be an arbor. Very, very rare. Okay. Um, so the motion, any discussion on the, to waive the rules? All those in favor? 14, 1038. Okay. Unanimous. All right. Um, I'll move we adopt the proclamation. Second. Okay. Yep. One thing, if you're going to adopt it, please, you need to make sure that it's not a draft no longer and if you're right. acceptable with it it's no longer a draft right so <laughs> right okay so the motion has been made that we accept the the resolution as written yes, and uh, i made that and greg seconded so any discussion all those in favor unanimous thank you all right and I want to thank staff for drafting the resolution because it, it, it reads very well. Well, thanks to mom's folks for uh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I don't dad's demand that. Dad's are with us. Okay. Okay, you got the uh, Long Range Tennis uh, Grand Slam Green information. Um, and uh, for those of you who aren't aware of it, um, there is a proposal to rename part of South Entrance Road. Um, the part from Little Patuxent Parkway down to Toby's. 
for your information in case you haven't been there. It looks really different. They cut down a lot of trees. Yeah. Yeah. But new road. South, south, south entrance. South, oh. So the south entrance is going to... Or the non-south Yeah. So if you haven't been there, it's... What do they want to call it? Uh, Symphony, Symphony Woods, Woods road. road. The new road they're putting in. They're just going to run it all the way up to Little Ducton Parkway. Right. Yeah. Any, how, question, how did they choose the name of the road? Is there any kind of... uh, Howard Hughes chose the names of the roads. Uh, we don't and have a vote on this, right? No. So thank you. No, this is just for your information, Ms. Lena. Thank you. All right, tracking forms. Any? Nope. Well, talking points. Wow. Wow. The board voted to approve Liang, China, as a sister city. Yep. Uh, beverage cart service to Fairway Hills. Appointments to CA's Architectural Resource Committee. National Gun Violence Day Proclamation. And the board heard a presentation about the Patuxent Trail and storage facility to be constructed on Old Guilford Road. Andy. Yes. You know, something that, that Jen was saying about staff uh, approaching the developer. The staff intend to do that? Can we, can we get a commitment from staff? They're going to try to see if we can put the question to the developer. What would it take? Because um, Greg, I put that I, I, in in the meetings that I've been in, I, I've offered understanding. And I would qualify that I would have to bring any easement request to the board, but I offered to work with the developer. I offered to work with the county on any easement request, even the easement request coming off of Guilford Road, mm -hmm. and, and that's still on the table. So you know, be prepared. You will probably see an easement request coming from the county for a pathway along this. Sure. Andy, I would just like to say I really want to thank Milton and I want to thank Dennis for everything that they have done. They have really gone out of their way. They were willing to meet me. This is going back two months. They were willing to meet me on Friday. We we actually tramped through <laughs> tramped through the woods. <laughs> we looked at everything. They've gone back many times. Al has also worked on this. I really appreciate the staff going out of their way on this. And I think that Jen's point is well taken that given what our communities, I mean, Kings is just the first to experience this. All of our villages are going to be facing this. So we need to think now positively about the future is how do we get accurate information on who owns what how do we get out and make sure the maps that we're looking at are in fact accurate um find out where some of these hot spots might be so that we're we're not caught unawares and look at supporting perhaps a different kind of process in the county so that our Columbia villages don't go through this. So I just want to... Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't let this go. Just, uh -oh. I, uh -oh. I do not think... I, I was trying to I'm make sorry. it so you'd let it go. I'm sorry. I can't just... Hey, everybody pats each other on the back and goes home, folks. I mean, I, I just am not convinced. I, I understand, Mel, what you're saying. We have told them we're willing to give them an easement. But what I'm saying is, is there something else we can do instead of saying we will... We will receive and consider your easement request when you submit it to us. Is there a way we can be more, as Jen says, proactive, more affirmative, and say, hey, what can we do to work together, whether it's easement, whether it's whatever it is, I don't know. Uh, you know, Before they do any more work, before they make any, any more investments in changing this property in a way where it becomes expensive for them to do anything else. Greg, if the, if the developer said tomorrow they want to meet to talk with CA again, we would meet with them. We would offer them what we can within our means, whether it's, it's right now all we have to offer them is an easement. Well, there were three steps in that process. It, there was, it had to go under the CA, the, the middle step, and then there was the easement. Did they have to do the first two to get the easement, or could they... Well, well, yes, going back, understanding, I, I can, for example, when, when, when we first talked to them, they brought up the fact, uh, this was at the, Ham, uh, at the Hammond High School, that we had requested the annual, they had to be subject to the annual charge, the rack, and also the easement. 
I didn't know whether I had the authority to say I could take away the rag, but I told them I would approach the board about the annual charge, and I would approach the board about the easement. Right. right. He, <clears throat> Milton does not have the authority to, I mean, a process is if you want to, you want an easement, we offer those three things, and then we work from there. And it's the board's decision. <clears throat> you know, it's not, right. you know, it's not Milton's. They, yeah, they didn't. I mean, it's 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 extra money to them. But isn't this a done deal? Uh, pretty much. It sounds like it's a done deal. Yeah. So why do they even need to come to CA they at this don't point? Need they don't to come. Come. They don't CA. Because they don't that's need. what it sounded. They don't need to right. come to us. And so it's, I think we need to approved. go to them and say, okay, just this last question, Milton. Please, if you, if you could just you and Dennis, you could just say, okay, to this developer, okay, what would it take to do this, and and see what it. As opposed to, because right now what I'm hearing is, I mean, right now you've already got traffic, you've already got truck and bulldozer and everything else traffic there. You've already got the risk to public safety. It's happening right now. Mm -hmm. The only question is how long we're going to continue to let it happen. And so I'm just saying, is there something we can do to go to the developer now and say, okay, as part of your building this, on this huge lot over here and all these investments you're making, mm -hmm. if you could take a little bit of that effort and deal with this little trail problem and solve it so that you remove the public safety issue mm -hmm. while you're building this and then going forward. What would it take, Mr. Developer? What can we do, whether it's an easement, uh, whatever it is? I'm, I'm, no, I, I don't want to go there, whatever. I know, and that's one point. <laughs> well, well, but again, what? But the question has to be asked. What would it take? That's all I'm saying. I will, I will have... I would kind of, I have the develop. I will have at least I have one of the developer's business card, and we'll make the call tomorrow. So, so, Greg, what I need to understand from your discussion: Are you focusing on, I'll say, fixing the trail problem, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. I mean, which is basically what the county has, has said. I mean, they're just the county has proposed a solution. Okay, right. that's not the only solution to this. I'm and not the community a, doesn't think it's the best solution. Yes. So, how much money you're willing to put up? Well, Money. No, Again, well, well, I don't have to answer. I mean, I don't know. It, it is. It is a bottom kind. I mean, but right now we have cones and a rope, okay, with major machinery coming through with kids and families and bikes and strollers, okay? It's nuts. It's strange, right? So, what you probably want to do is ask the county to put in barriers, right? We require the director. I want barriers. to go to the developer and say, boy, you have a problem. Let's yeah. solve the problem. What will it take? I think what it Jenny, a Jen. Okay. The Two quick things. First of all, I did my, my legislation was pre-filed today, so I, you can look at that. But um, I think Greg is, has the exact right question. And I, I, I would thank um, Milton and Dennis as well. I mean, they definitely have been willing to work with a developer, but it's exactly what Greg was saying. It's a proactive approach. It's what would it take? And that, I think, hasn't happened. I will say I think the county has more of a piece of the responsibility here in terms of them being able to offer something. But my understanding is that the biggest piece is how long this is going to take them. And so if they're concerned, sorry, am I supposed to talk closer to this? Okay. Um, the biggest piece of this is how long it is. So if part of your piece of it is an easement and the other pieces, and I, I'm not going to re-summarize those, but if they could be assured that that would happen quickly or if the board voted and said we would allow for that easement if they would change the entrance, their fear is that they'll let go of something that's approved. And I think this is a totally reasonable thing for a developer to say, we have something approved, and we, we're afraid to let that go for something that is a maybe. And so again, I think you know Milton has certainly talked to them. I know the county has. But it has always been, we're willing to do whatever you want. It hasn't been, what would it take for you to do this? And I think that's the difference. OK, um, we have a closed meeting afterwards. Thanks. By the way, this I will, is, I will make the call tomorrow. Thank you. By the way, this is a really interesting issue, and I hope the board remembers this because this is why we're going to look at the development regulation process. Because one of the things that has to be looked at <coughs> is out parcels. <coughs> Plus, yes. this is typical Euclidean zoning. This is not any right. kind of. But the problem isn't the zoning here. The problem no, is but, the. But, but overall, it's in, in terms of the out parcels and how things get zoned and things like that, and the process that things go through, mm -hmm. and so this is the uh, this is the opportunity coming up with to look at this whole thing in total. And you're right; if you want to put it into the law, which says if you border X, Y, and Z, you must. It's well, mine just says it has to give notice, right. right? Mine says you have to give notice. At my the bill that's the bill. So what I was going to just offer to you all, not as a board, because you probably you won't need. 
I can definitely do that. Do I send it to each one of you, or is there a There's yeah? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Um, but if any of you can think of anything that you'd want added to that bill that you think would be helpful, um, I don't know that we can get them to come out to the village board. We can have a conversation about maybe how that is, but I think it's about getting you guys notice, so you know to pay attention, so you can weigh in and say, actually, this is really an important pathway. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Don't forget. All right. So we're going to adjourn. We're going to close meeting upstairs.